Hey, Lou, if it's okay for you now, uh, it would be great if you could jump over to the Shadow the Scientist Zoom link. Um, that way you can share the Jira's screen. Okay, got you. Okay, thanks, Lou. So uh, one of the other observers, Lu Shen, who was a graduate student at UC Davis, where Brian was a postdoc. I was a postdoc there a long time ago. Um, she's now in China. Um, so she's actually joining from China. She's gonna hop in and join us. And what she's going to do is share her screen, which has some of the same displays that Brian has up right in front of him. So you'll get to see what the instrument and telescope controls look like. Okay, so now you see my colleague Lou has started sharing the screen that she has set up, which actually has multiple windows on it. So where Brian is sitting, you can see he has a whole host of monitors in front of him. Duplicates of five of those screens are up on the desktop that Lou is sharing. So you can see it takes a lot of various interfaces and control windows to run a telescope and the camera. So there are windows that show the status of the telescope, and where it's pointing and what it's doing. If you see the bottom right window that says setup field in blue letters, in that window, uh, you can see a bunch of text in the bottom right of that window. Those are the commands that tell the camera and the telescope what to do. So it'll say, move to a certain field, put in these filters, take an exposure for this long, and things like that. So Lou uh, prepared that observing file in advance with our observing program. And the staff scientists at Subaru are executing it. And we talk with them as the night goes on changing things as conditions warrant, or if there's a problem, pausing and things like that. In the top left of her window, you see something that looks like a target, a round circle. That's actually basically a view of the whole sky looking up from this Monakea, and it shows where the targets that we're interested in looking at, that's the sort of blurry white and green text. And then there's a little picture of the telescope and a little red line that shows how, where it's moving from on its way to pointing at the targets that we're interested in. Hey, Andrew. Uh, yeah. Um, did you guys get a, a seeing estimate for the first half of the night or any trends? 0.8 to about one, what did you say? Oh. 0.7. 0.7. 0.7 0 0.7 in H-band or in the different band? Yeah, it's about one. Yeah, it's about one. Yeah. Yeah. 
And that was a recent measurement? Uh, that was a recent measurement or that was uh, earlier in the night? Uh, maybe, uh, two hours ago. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, I'm just trying to get a like a gauge because we're um we're trying to like balance breadth and depth of our observations. And so we've had pretty good uh luck with the last couple of nights. And so we may push it a little bit harder if the conditions are very good and warrant it. Um so yeah, I'm just trying to get an idea of like how long ago that was and maybe what air mass you guys were at when when you were taking those observations. Um, I don't have a very recent one for us. Uh, CFHT has been reporting around 0.5 to 0.8 lately, and that is at air mass, uh, air mass 1.02, yeah, around there, near Zeta. Okay. Um, yeah, there's a... Uh, that's the, that's the gem. Yeah, it's yeah. yeah, okay. I find I, their mass is always very, very low. <laughs> yeah. Really yeah, well, that's with all the ground layer, I think. Yeah. So that helps. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> if you ignore that, that helps. Um, okay, that, that sounds pretty good. So, um, okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, I'll leave that up. And how often do we get a seeing estimate? Uh, do we get it on the raw frames, or do you guys take it, or how 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 do we monitor this? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, we using uh, you can see this Yes. And the uh, using the bright star mm -hmm. in this grid um, uh, for example, this one. Uh, we have six uh, star size, six uh, four point four nine six eight. Okay. It doesn't quite see. Uh, the plate scale for this for swims. So the start size is in uh, arc seconds. Yeah, okay. Uh, that is very good, and that's one raw frame. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, 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 I continue to uh, take the same thing using this. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Hey, Brian. Yeah. Uh, you can tell them that uh, the field is, is good, it's right. I, I just checked it with uh, our finder chart. Okay. So we have we have Lou on the other uh, Zoom, and she just checked against our finder chart, and everything looks good in the field. So it looks like the pointing is good and everything, just as a confirmation. Thank you. So Lou, we're at 0.5 arc second seeing, uh, in case you didn't hear, and. Um, and no attenuation, so we're like 0.04 mags of attenuation according to CloudCam. Okay, so that's um, good. I will, I will uh, write the log. Okay, sounds good. But 
Um, Brian, maybe you can tell them uh, that anytime they're ready, they can uh, go to the science target. So is this not a science frame that we're taking already? No, we, t we just took the, the fo uh, oh, they're, they're doing focusing. Okay, let them do it. Okay. So do that that artifact in the in the image here. Mm -hmm. What is it that be, from? Uh, I think it's from CCD or I don't know. And the, I think what they they said is because of the 
edge of the filter. Uh, but but what I think is is due to the CCD. Um, but it will eventually remove the after the data reduced. So uh, this is a pretty big artifact. Um, is our our desert pattern is big enough to? No, this? it's the flat will take over that. Take care of that. But do we, uh, but we are not getting photons there, as far as I can see. Is that is that correct? It, but when I, when I see the reduced image, it is not there. And even each frame, it is not there. Mm. Mm. Uh, yes, sir. you speaking to me? I see this window. Uh, yes. Uh, the, the finding stuff for the lattice uh, is zero key on the top. Is it correct? Sorry, can you repeat? Yes. Yeah. Were you asking they say or? something like finder chart. Oh. Uh, okay, uh, so the, at the summit they're asking us to confir confirm the field. Is that? Yeah, it's uh, right. It's right. It's still the same field, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, we confirmed it. It's correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Do, do you okay. recognize that from the stars in the field? Um. So I'm I'm comparing the uh, the finder chart I took uh, from the Sloan data. Got gotcha. you. Uh, so gotcha. it's showing the stars. I can see, I can see those three stars. Yeah, I can see those yeah. three. So this three, this one, two, and three is the same as what I see from um, like at Sloan image at the same pointing so uh, on the in the right half you see three more stars and i can see those three stars in that image with the artifact yeah um so here is one mm -hmm. I, I, I can't quite see your cursor actually oh okay <laughs> but now i can now i can yeah when you're moving okay yeah yeah, yeah i see those three stars exactly. <laughs> it's a really nice asterism there the the yeah, yeah. six stars there it's quite obvious um, so, Lou, so I still don't get it. So there's this dead spot in the in the in the CCD, you think? And so, okay, flat fields out, but still uh, we're going to have yeah. an issue with not getting uh, full depth. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the the one I stacked the image, the mosaic will uh, cover that part. Um, so it's not it's it's not the flag, but the mosaic. Uh, but what I see from the image is okay. And we have a, a like quite a large radius on the dither. Do you know the size of the feature and the size of our dither pattern? I didn't measure that. I can do that really quick. Which artifact are you talking about, by the way? Um, it's no longer visible, but there was um, in one of the. Yeah, I remember that. I remember seeing it in one of the audio frames. Yeah, so there's a there's a large. It almost looks like somebody put their finger down on the detector, and yeah, the, yeah. The, oops, and then removed their finger really quickly, and so you only got a little part of it. Um, but it looks like it, it takes up about a third of the detector in the y direction, which is very large. You can kind of see it in the the Jingo window there um, on the left hand column, oh, yeah. second row down. Mm -hmm. So Brian, I don't know if you as a host can do it or if you want to add me as a co-host and then we can annotate onto the screen if that's useful. True. That would be helpful. Yeah, there it is. You just saw it. Yeah. <clears throat> so, right, you're now co host. <laughs> okay, let me see if I can uh, annotate.
I see it in some frames, not in others. That is because there's each, there's a blue side and a red side. Gotcha. And then each side has two channels. I see. So it's only in one of those. One of the four. So for those joining us, this instrument is kind of neat. Usually when you take have a camera, you can put in one filter and you take a picture through that filter. This instrument splits the light and almost bluer light goes down one side and somewhat redder light goes down the other. And so you can put different filters on each side. And that's what we're doing. It's all infrared light, we're actually looking at wavelengths that are longer than we see with our eyes. So even though we see the pictures on the screen, the light that's coming from these objects is in the infrared. Because these objects are very far away, the, what we're looking at is light that was visible light when it left those objects, but has been stretched by the expansion of the universe to be in the infrared. <laughs> I, uh, I take a first loop, okay? Okay. Okay. You said first, first loop, correct? Yeah, okay, great. Thank you. So they've gotten set up and you heard Brian say first loop. What they're gonna do is take a picture, move the telescope a little bit, take a picture, the telescope a little bit, take the picture, and it's gonna do that automatically. And that way we cover a little bit larger area, but also any defects in the CCD won't end up in the same part of the picture every time. So we can kind of average them out. And it takes us, one of these loops that we're doing takes 26 minutes. So while it's running, we have, everyone will have a little bit of time to uh, chat with you. And they'll just keep an eye on making sure that the images as they come out look okay and everything's operating all right. Andrew, the, the size of our dither pattern, um, do you happen to know that? Um, the I size know. is 20 or uh, 20 arc second, Brian. Uh, 20 arc second is radius. 20 arc second radius. Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. It's a nine point dither. Hmm. Brian, the structure is something like, uh, the artifact is something like 35 oh, yeah. oh, yeah. arc second by 35 arc second. So it's uh, the detector, each detector is about three by three arc minutes, is that right? 3.3, .3, yeah. 3.3. 3.3, okay. Interesting. Yeah, 3 .3. And, uh, I just re I I kind of reduced uh, try this uh, chip on this chip, and it's removed. So I kind of feel like it's okay. <laughs> okay, I mean the the size of the structure is is quite a bit bigger than our dither pattern. It it will likely have some differential effect on our depth, almost certainly. On on this part, yeah. Right. And, but it's not like, yeah, but this part is fixed in detector space, but not fixed on the sky because of the dither pattern. So we're going to induce a kind of strange differential loss of light across the mosaic, which we should be cognizant of when we, when yeah. we try to analyze the images. Yeah. So that's why I was trying to make sure that the, the PA is right and it won't had on the overdense part. Oh, okay, that's smart, Lou. Okay, so you've you've situated the pointing and the PA such that um, this artifact is the artifacts only in the narrow band image. Yes, only the uh, no, only the yeah, the blue the blue part. The blue side, which blue is band. the more scientifically interesting side for us, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. Um, I think okay. I do do the right that is not on our overdense part <laughs> because the the chip and the number of the chip 
and on um, I think it's one on this on the right right side and two on the left side. Um, so it's kind of inverse. <laughs> okay. But so the artifact is not centered at the center of the over density. Yeah. I okay. hope it's not. Like I, I was trying to set it now. But we also have a four arc minute uncertainty in the in the, end of the over density center. So maybe that's a that our ignorance in this case is a is somewhat of a virtue. Yeah. Uh, if if this is really um, an issue, um, like maybe for the for the tomorrow, uh, we can uh, just flip all the target to a hundred degree. Mm -hmm. 180 degrees. 180, yeah. Yeah, that I think that would be a smart idea, no matter what, because this is going to affect the observations. And if we can spread that out as much as possible, um, yeah. as long as I mean, the idea here is, especially for this structure, we don't really know where the overdensity is, and so we we want to take an agnostic view, and so we want to have uh, you know as uniform depth as possible, so that we're, if we're for missing something, we know it's not because of the observations, but it's rather because there's nothing there. Yeah. I, I think we can go, go that way. Um, like today we may have six, six for one pointing, and the other day we can have three on the inverse uh, flip. Okay. And we're, we're trying to do a nine loop uh, depth still? Yes. Okay. If possible. Um, and so the way is we can just split to four and five. But that would require doing something different this evening, correct? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, but so um, are, are we for sure going to go for full depth? Uh, have you been well, able to make any progress on the reduction? I'm doing it right now. <laughs> okay. All right. So maybe we can uh, decide as the night goes along what we think is prudent in terms of um, depth versus breadth. And I think trying to make it as uniform as possible. If we're uh, if we are going to go for nine loop depth in each pointing, then trying to make it as uniform as possible uh, would be good, which mean, would mean four and five. Yes. Yeah, four and five. Okay. We can decide one like at the fourth loop. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. So we have we have about uh about an hour and a half before we would need to decide that. Uh yeah, yeah. What, about 24 so for minutes. Each, each loop it will take twenty-seven minutes. Uh, about half an hour. Yeah, okay. That sounds good. Yeah, we're observing in the infrared, and so everything the telescope, you, the sky glows and gives off infrared light. So if you just stared at the sky with infrared yeah. eyes uh, or with an infrared camera and you added up the light, eventually you would basically overexpose the whole detector. So in the infrared, often our exposures are very short and you have to take lots and lots of them. And then you add together all those pictures in the computer later on to make a deep picture. So when we observe a field like this with visible light, we might be able to expose for 15 minutes or half an hour, even in imaging. But at the, in the infrared, we're going two and a half minutes in one filter and just over a minute in the other. And these are narrow band filters, so they don't cover a lot of portion of the spectrum. 
if these were broadband filters, the exposures might be three seconds over and over and over again. So Brian, do you mind if I take over screen sharing? I'll show some of the figures we used in the proposal, sort of explain what we're doing. Uh, not at all. That would be Lou, but I think you're a co-host now, so you can take yeah. over. But maybe before we do that, we could just kind of introduce ourselves now that all we're... Right. Okay. Now that we're in a little bit of a relaxed state <laughs> for the time being. Um, so, Roy, I think you already did some introductions at the beginning, but um, I can introduce myself and then maybe everybody from the science team could uh, introduce themselves. So I'm Brian. Hi. Uh, I'm actually a staff scientist at Gemini Observatory, which is uh, basically across the street from Subaru base facility. I'm not on the summit of Mauna Kea, as Roy mentioned earlier. So I'm down at Hilo on the big island, which is I'm here, I'm about 500 feet above sea level. And so the people behind me that are on the summit, they're uh, 13,000 feet above me, just, just to the west. So I can actually see them. Um, from the back uh, porch here, if it weren't dark out right now. <laughs> um, so, uh, so I'm one of the the scientists, one of the astronomers for this evening. Um, I will pass to Lou since Lou is uh, running these observations and has been our superstar for the Subaru observations uh, to introduce herself. Hi, uh, he hello everyone. Uh, my name is Lucian. I'm uh, right now. Uh, working at University of Science and Technology of China. Um, I work with Brian in my PhD and also Roy. Uh, so what should I say? <laughs> um, do you want to say, Lou, like uh, kind of like what we're observing tonight? Um, Roy mentioned a little bit earlier, but uh, we have kind of a special, I don't know, risky observation tonight. Uh, yeah. Do you want to explain a little bit what that is? Um, so today, tonight we're observing a potential uh, like over density uh, that found using the lemma alpha tomography. So in the lemma alpha tomography, you are seeing the light from the background source, and it will uh, th if there is a, a structure in a in the front, it will showing in, uh, in the lemma alpha forest range are uh, uh, that uh, a lower like uh, flux. Um, so there's a absorption there. Um, using that method, uh, so it's called lemma alpha tomography. Uh, Andrew Newman uh, from our Carnegie Observatory, they found uh, uh, this is called lattice, the survey. Uh, they found a uh, over density um, in at redshift 2.44. Um, but when they trying to see how many galaxies there, they see uh, uh, not over dense um, there. Um, so right now we're observing uh, this target. Um, so this structure, focusing on this structure and trying to see if there's galaxy over dense there. And we're targeting the, um, we're using a narrowband filter a uh, narrowband uh, 1326 uh, to see if there is a O2 em em emission emitter galaxy. Uh, and we also have uh, um, H3 band to hopefully see the H delta and O3 e emission. Um, that's, yeah, that, that, that's what we are observing right now. Uh, Brian, you. do you want to add on that? Um, yeah, I'll just I'll just add a few things. So just to um, to maybe uh, make it a little bit more accessible, um, we are are looking at at what we suspect is an overdensity of mass in the universe. So we suspect 
based on this method that uh, Lou just mentioned, which I, I see Roy explained a little bit in the chat. So um, there's there's cool gas, which is conglomerated, has accreted into this region of the sky. This is about um, 10.5 billion light years away. Um, and so there seems to be a lot of mass there um, because there's this cool material that's fallen into this region. But for some reason, some weird reason, um, there doesn't seem to be any galaxies that have formed there. So we don't know, we don't know why that might be. And it may be that we've just missed them in the past. And so we're going to try to uh, look really deeply tonight. We're going to take pictures really deeply tonight um, to target galaxies which should be forming stars at a very high rate. So this is the singly ionized oxygen emission. And if we if we see some galaxies there, then that kind of makes sense to us. And this will be an overdensity of galaxies. And this is the kind of structure that we study and hooray. So we get to do some, some galaxy evolution stuff. And if we don't see any galaxies there, then that's really, really a mystery. And we have to try to figure out what that means with models. So, uh, Preeti, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, hi, my name is Preeti Stepp. I work with Brian, Roy, Lou, Ekta, um, and also uh, Professor Laura Lubin from UC Davis. I'm a third year PhD student. Um, as I mentioned in the chat before this, I did electrical engineering and um, some theoretical physics. So you can definitely transition for your grad studies, um, no matter what your discipline is before that. Um, and I study galaxies um, and clusters that are um, forming. Um, so group, sorry, clusters of galaxies that are in the formation. Um, and I look at Currently, I'm looking at um, if they're forming stars or not. Um, and yeah, that's my current project. And I see Akta just joined us. Welcome, Akta. And um, maybe also, uh, so Preeti, you're in Davis right now, Davis, California, right? And Akta is not. Where are you joining, joining from, Akta? I'm joining it from India. So it's uh, around four o'clock here. And- uh, In the afternoon, yeah? Yes. Yeah, you're luckier uh, than us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> here it's 1.22 in the morning. Yeah. Um, so uh, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Ikta Shah. I am a postdoctoral research scholar in this group and I study uh, how galaxies form and evolve in the early clusters that Preeti just mentioned. So clusters when they are just forming, how does that kind of dense environment affect the star formation rate and other properties of galaxies? And for that, we use these kind of multivalent observations, uh, both spectroscopic, spectroscopic and photometric observations, which gives you a lot of information about the galaxies and their dense environment. So. Thank you, Ekta. And uh, Raja, would you mind introducing yourself for people who don't know you? Certainly. Uh, I'm Raja Gohatakutta. I'm a professor in the Astronomy and Astrophysics Department at UC Santa Cruz. And I know several of you on this call. Casey Peters is one of the undergraduates at UC Santa Cruz who's been working in our research group. Um, Brian used to be an undergraduate at UC Santa Cruz many years ago. We worked together then. That's how we know each other. Uh, I've known Roy for a long time. Um, I met Preeti and Hector mm -hmm. yesterday. Uh, I know Arya because Arya has been connecting to our Shadow the Scientist sessions for on many occasions. And um, I've been talking to Mariam Hamidi, who's connected from Iran and who's interested in um, starting graduate school in astrophysics in the US uh, this fall. I know Pran, who's been, um, who's the organizer of Astronomy Outreach of Kosovo. Um, she's, a, you know, she's a graduate student in the Earth and Planetary Sciences just across the plaza from me in, at UC Santa Cruz. Um, I'm, uh, I haven't been doing research with 
uh, the group here on protoclusters. But what I have been doing is using telescope time that my research group gets to, um, to host the Shadow of the Scientist sessions. And Brian, Roy, and I talked about trying this out with time that their group has received on the telescope. And that, that's, that's really why I'm here tonight. And so if you guys have any questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat. We're going to kind of just uh, do a, a normal night on the telescope, we hope, uh, without any excitement. Um, there usually is excitement, but we want the good kind of excitement where we see something interesting rather than the telescope breaking or something like that. Um, but yeah, so feel free to put uh, questions in the chat or raise your hand, um, and we will try to uh, get to your questions as soon as possible. Oh, there's an excellent question about comparing to X-ray data. So often people do study galaxy clusters in X-rays. The reason we study them in X-rays, for those who don't know, is that galaxy clusters with their huge mass can hold on to very hot gas, gas that's millions of degrees Kelvin, and gas that's that temperature emits in X-rays, just like the sun's corona. Um, but these early clusters, these proto-clusters of the kind that we're looking at generally have not um, formed and had enough time to sort of make a deep enough gravitational well to hold on to gas that, that that's that hot. The, if you know the sun is in equilibrium between the pressure uh, due to the temperature and the motion of the gas and gravity pulling in. In these galaxy clusters, it's the same thing. The gravity of all the mass in the galaxy cluster can hold on to this hot gas. In these early proto clusters, as we call them, they haven't sort of developed that deep gravitational well that can hold on to that kind of uh, gas. So we don't observe these in X-rays. Even if they had that at this great distance, they would be very challenging to observe in X-rays. I don't know, Brian, you want to add something? Or... Um, yeah, it's a great question, really great question, and it's it's a question that we're trying to um, address with with these observations exactly. So these these upper densities of mass can be traced by different things. So it could be this cool gas, um, it could be hot gas, as we just mentioned. There can be galaxies there. There may not be galaxies there for some reason, um, as may be the case in this particular structure that we're looking at now. Um, but right at this uh, at this distance away, so about 10.5 billion light years, this is kind of the transition period for these overdensities to move from kind of containing cool gas and, and very strongly star forming galaxies to uh, beginning to heat up that gas gravitationally and starting to um, uh, quench the star formation in the galaxies that are in these systems. And so the system that we were looking at last night, which is called Hyperion, which is a which is a known really, really big structure of galaxies at the same distance away. Um, this system actually has uh, small conglomerations. So they're not small, they're <laughs> much bigger than the Milky Way, but small in the size of, of the, the scale of, of this object. Um, so some conglomerations of galaxies which contain cool gas, so they're very young, um, where young means you know they formed a billion years ago or so, um, and other conglomerations of galaxies where we see X-ray emission. So the gas has already had time to heat up. And so uh, we see a large diversity of these types of structures at this distance, and we want to understand what makes certain structures uh, hot and, and contain galaxies which are not forming stars very much, and other structures where we see this cool gas and we see galaxies which are forming stars at a very high rate. And so that's exactly what we're trying to, to understand with these observations here. So we don't know the answer yet. Move 
We have a question that says, uh, what's the greatest discovery in astronomy? I bet you could have uh, heated arguments over this. Um, and we're talking today uh, about these objects that are 10 billion light years away. And we know that, but a hundred years ago, we did not know that objects could be that far away. And we didn't even know if the little fuzzy things that people saw in pictures were galaxies outside the Milky Way or were the Milky Way was the whole universe. So one answer to that question would be learning that the universe is much, much bigger than uh, we thought. Today, I might say that finding all these planets around other stars and understanding how common planets are might be one of the top five or top 10 discoveries, the expansion of the universe. There's understanding how the sun works, that it's nuclear fusion. I'm sure other people have uh, other options that they can put in for great discoveries in, in astronomy. I think a cool one that we don't think about, or at least I haven't heard people say, is understanding that the material that everyone on this Zoom call is made out of was inside a star at some point. All of that carbon, all of that oxygen was made in a star or a bunch of stars blown out into space and then formed into the earth. And here we are today. I think that's a pretty top discovery. I think it's also great that, uh, you know, because of the fact that we are and all this stuff around us was made in stars, that also means that, you know, the spectroscopic lines that you see in lab, in some ways that those will be the, like in hydrogen atom, those will be the lines that will be emitted in some distant star. So you can, in some ways you can understand the spectroscopic nature of different elements on earth. And then you can use that information to understand, you know, this astronomical systems that are far, far away. So I think uh, that is also super cool. So Andrew, we're just gonna do another uh, loop after this. So right? Does anyone here a planet formation expert? Someone asked about rogue planets. I think there's a, actually multiple ways you get planets without stars. So there's actually no clean dividing line between stars and planets. So when we talk about rogue planets, those are typically super Jupiter. So there are things that are a few times uh, the mass of Jupiter. And you can form those from the same clouds of material that form stars, and they're just failed stars. They just didn't have quite enough material to turn off nuclear fusion in their cores. And so that rogue planet, you could also think about it as a failed star. In some cases, you could have planets like Jupiter that formed around the star out of the disk of material that was around that star. And then there was an interaction with another star. and it got kicked out gravitationally, and that's why it's floating through space. And in some ways, it might be impossible to tell the difference, or maybe there are ways to tell the difference, I'm not sure. And that kind of distinction, planet, star, I mean, a star, you can think of it has, the, has or can have nuclear fusion in its core. And if it doesn't have that, then it's not a star. So sometimes we can make clean classifications, but 
just like we argue about is Pluto a planet or not, astronomers always start by classifying things and putting them into some kind of bins, elliptical galaxy, spiral galaxy, a rocky planet, gas giant. But inevitably, it's a continuum of objects and where you draw the line is often not based in physics, at least certainly not at the start. So the answer to Arya's question is yes. Our round door stars or planets. Generally, we think of a planet as orbiting another star. But what if you have a super Jupiter orbiting a sun like a totally normal star? Is it a failed star orbiting a working star? Is it a, just a big planet? So it, it's there's no clean answer. If it's floating through space by itself, is it a rogue planet or rogue planet? Sounds like a, a Star Wars movie. Well, Raja will appreciate this for us old timers, right? Brian's not quite old timer enough, but I was in graduate school when the first exoplanet was discovered. So, I think the fact that the work that astronomers and other scientists are doing in other fields are basically rewriting our understanding of the universe in real time is really interesting. So 30 years ago, we didn't know if the fraction of stars with planets was close to 0% or close to 100%. We had identically zero understanding of what that number would be or should be. But today, our textbooks are writing and talking about exoplanets like we knew about them all along but we didn't when I was in graduate school. <laughs> so it's pretty remarkable how the pace of discovery is going on. And those of you who are younger and listening into this will be part of rewriting textbooks 20 years from now. So I think that's really important to stress in, you know, in science classes in high school often, it's like, here's a bunch of facts and that's it. But it's actually, the cool part of science is that those facts are just a small part of the picture. Yeah, um, so Mehul and I have been chatting about the fact that the first planets to be discovered outside the solar system were actually discovered around pulsars, dead stars. So you knew those, those planets could not sustain life as we know it. But technically that was the first discovery of, the, of, of exoplanets. But those didn't get as much attention as when people started finding planets around sun-like stars. Good reason. No, that's not. All right, if you're ready for a little bit of trivia, um, you know, we, one of our very basic units of time is an hour. It's 1 24th of a day. You know, we, we measure how long it takes for the earth to spin once. You know, how long it takes for the sun to be at its highest point, um, you know, two successive times and take that time we divide it into by 24. We call that an hour, you know, why 24? Because 24 you know, has nice factors, you know, divisible by two, three, four, six, eight, lots of factors. When we take an hour and we divide it, divide it into 60 parts, right? We call it a minute. Again, 60 has lots of factors two, three, five, you know, lots of factors, 12, 15. The reason it's called a minute because it's a minute part of an hour, no, minute. And the reason um, we call a second a second is it's because it's the second time you devise the unit. That's why you have hours, minutes, seconds, and you also have degrees, arc minutes and arc seconds. Apparently in Newton's Principia, there's references to 
the third minutum, the third minute, not the second minute, but the third minute, which is one sixtieth of a second. So this is a little bit of trivia. Astronomical trivia. Um, you guys, I won't be connected on this Zoom. Can one of you share your screen? I can't see what's going on. Roy, do you want to show something or I can share the screen? You're you muted. can share the control screen back. Okay. So Lou, just so you know, um, we just got another seeing estimate from the summit and it's holding steady at 0 0.5. Okay, thank you. Great. So this is this is really good. And we're still waiting to transit. So we're still at 1.1 air masses. So hopefully it should even get better. This is actually a remarkable observing run through the winter. Absolutely incredible, yeah. In the Mauna Kea has weather. It's very cold and snowy in the winter. So getting a row of clear nights with good atmospheric conditions is not that common. And we've had a lot of nights this winter, including Christmas. The telescopes do not close for Christmas, most of them. Actually, some of us here were observing on Christmas Eve. We did not see Santa. I was worried about JWST running into Santa. <laughs> it was, uh, I think we were on the telescope when it got launched. I wasn't personally, I was sleeping. I was up. I was, I was waiting for my stocking to be filled. You were up. <laughs> uh, Akta and I, I think. Yeah. Should have, should have taken some narrow band images of the. <laughs> Uh, that was Moss Fire, I think. So that was on Keck. So that was very precious time. And no narrowband imaging. I was actually more excited to see that the that our observations went through that night because that was sandwiched in between two very crazy storms on Mauna Kea. And we just barely got the dome open on Christmas Eve. And we observed Christmas Eve and then Christmas Day, Christmas Day night. And then another storm rolled in about 10 hours later and closed this for about a week and a half. So only two nights in December, I think, that were observable, or that last half of December that were observable on CAC we got. Lou, if you stop sharing for a second, I can show pictures from the from the summit right now. Sure, yours. So this is what it looks like. Um, this is what we're looking at, kind of. <laughs> so this is from the Gemini Observatory. 
let me move my zoom screen. So this, these are pictures from the Gemini Observatory pointing in different directions on the summit of Mauna Kea. So this is a atmospheric uh, cloud cam. So this is a satellite. This is looking straight up from the Gemini Observatory. And Gemini Observatory is located just about mm, half a kilometer to the south, let's see, southeast of Subaru. So if you look at this picture here, the, the North Cam, um, this is uh, two telescopes which are just adjacent to Subaru. Subaru is just off to the left in this picture. And then this is looking towards Hilo, where I am, um, and uh, different parts of Monica. And you can see planes moving around in the background, but we're basically at the top of the world here. <laughs> and you see all the clouds passing by. Um, and luckily, those are not high enough for it to affect the observation. So we have a nice clear sky for tonight. And this is very rare for this time of year. So we're very excited to be able to observe. You can see snow on the ground from those, those previous storms, but nothing tonight. Mauna Kea is at some seriously high altitude. I remember when I first started observing there, I, I, I sort of used to hesitate to call it ground-based observing. It didn't sort of seem like it. It felt very lunar to be on that mountain top. <laughs> It's truly an amazing place. Yeah, because back then there was no remote observing. You had to go to the summit. Oh, I started. I started observing in 1995, and it was uh, just a brutal experience. Jet lag, sleep deprivation, and oxygen deprivation combined. That sounds pretty normal for you, Raja. That's true. Even, two of those even when even when we down, went down to Waimea, there was at least two of those things. <laughs> two of those things. <laughs> two out of three ain't bad. Is that oh, the Roger, moon you were... in the lower right picture? What's that? Is that the moon in the lower right picture? Um, the moon is passing by, yeah. Yeah, and that's probably glare on the camera from the moon. So I think the moon is about 70% to full, right? So yeah, it's, it's very bright. It'll probably be setting in, um, I guess, is uh, about hour 15 minutes. Um, yeah, Subaru is one of the only telescopes that you can still go up to the summit to observe. So, in fact, had we really, really wanted to deprive ourselves, of, well, deprive me of oxygen tonight, um, <laughs> we we could have we could have requested that. But since my house is about uh, half a kilometer away from the base facility, I decided I would be comfortable tonight and not go on the summit. <laughs> Since the pandemic, actually. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. No, get it, get it, get it. So, uh, you, you guys don't allow anybody up there uh, since the pandemic? Yeah, at least. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, I got three nights up there in 2017 using Surprise Camp, which was absolutely amazing. And I spent most of the time with the night vision goggles. Fair enough. Okay. And we had, we had one. What's that? Oh, I definitely spent quite a bit of time with those night vision goggles. Yeah, as if the as if the mono weren't absolutely amazing enough at night that seriously enhances the experience. We had one of our collaborators that was supposed to be driving the telescope. Um, Start to get affected about halfway through the night. I had oxygen deprivation. And so we stuck him in the massage chair as he was uh, laughing maniacally. And he <laughs> passed the rest of the night in the massage chair as we drove the telescope. Yeah, Greg, you do have to keep an eye on that. It's uh, not at all uncommon for people to have poor reactions. I heard you guys got rid of that chair up there. Is that right? Uh, it died, but we got to replace it. Oh, okay. I'll have to we still have one. Okay, I will request summit observations the next time if the, if the pandemic abates. Just another reason to root for the pandemic to abate. Exactly.
but yeah, in theory, uh, Subaru is is one of the only telescopes that you can observe from the summit as as a as a guest observer. Uh, Raja, were you? Did you ever do Keck observing from the summit? Yep. So already, Roger, you, yeah. 2002, I guess, 2003, when we when I first started observing with you, it was uh, uh, required to be in my math. Oh, I see. Okay. Well, Roger, um, you and I observed, this, that was my first year on Mauna Kea too, it was 1995. Okay. Yeah, I remember observing with Elris then on the summit and then with NERC. Um, I remember what other instruments. I think by the time Demos came online in 2002, we were working from Waimea. Yeah, my first run was definitely in Waimea. Was that, what year was that, right? 2002? That was late 2003, early 2004. Okay. So I'm thinking, I'm wondering, I think perhaps when Demos was commissioned, well, certainly the commission, people who commissioned went up to the summit, but I think maybe the first observing what might have been at the summit too. I'm, mm -hmm. I, I don't remember now. It's been, and with that lack of oxygen on the summit, I've forgotten everything. But I do remember being on the Keck 2 telescope on the its second and third night of operation. And that was back then, for some reason, the semester that time started in October, not August. There was some shift of the semester, maybe because of the commissioning. No, actually it wasn't the semester. The Keck telescope was went online on October 1st of 1996. We were on on second and third and the segments kept failing in the sense that there would be this automatic voice that would come on and, and you would see your, the guide star break up into 36 parts. Is this the, the ACS is not settled? ACS is not settled. It was Sharon Schutz's voice. We used to work at CAC. It was her recorded voice that we started to, you know, it was like, you started to dread this in the middle of the night. Uh -huh. Hearing that voice. Yeah, now you only hear it during Amira. Now you only hear it during Amira. And yeah, so the Keck 2 telescope that Raj is talking about, that's the telescope on the left on the top right picture here. So kind in of north view. In the north view, yeah. So that's what you that's what you guys were using last night, right? So we were using last night, yeah. And then the telescope just to the to the right of that, to the east of that is IRTF. So it's a NASA run facility. I think it was during my first observing round, which was at the summit, I think with NERC. At that time, we did NERC at the summit, followed by El Rizin Waimea, I think. But at some point during the middle of the night, all the alarms in the tells start to go crazy. And like, what's going on? And the telescope operator's keyboard on an old Solaris workstation, the letter Q got stuck in the down position. <laughs> And it just sent like 10 million cues to the telescope control system and it just all the software just crashed i think history has a, a sense of humor because even tonight i saw the first half observers some keyboard got stuck on period and for about a half an hour there was just period showing up on the screen but i guess um let's see what 25 years of technology has allowed us to not crash the telescope when you get a keyboard stuck. So it seemed like things were going just fine, even though somebody had stuck the keyboard down. I, you're probably too young for this, Brian, but Solaris workstations did not take to things being unplugged. So replacing the keyboard was not like you could do it on your computer today. It actually would take down the entire workstation. So it took down the entire telescope control computer to replace the keyboard. Raj, I think the I think the computer that I used in your office, um, in between bouts of sleeping on your office floor when I was doing uh, z-specking, was the Solaris machine. Am I remembering that right? I think so. I think that's right. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah, that was definitely a trial by fire as an undergrad using that machine. So I can stop sharing now if you want to uh, reshare the share screen so that people can see our, our exposures. You know, I, I feel like I'm talking like an old man, which as if it's by my gray beard as well. But when I was an undergraduate student, I worked with Hubble Beta, some of the early Hubble Beta, and it was sent on those big giant tape reels that you see in movies. So you think of Hubble as being this advanced technology, but the internet wasn't fast enough to send the data to the university. So they just FedEx boxes of those big real to real tapes. So there was a time in my life I knew how to load those into tape readers. Right, did we, we, we were at Tololo at the same time also, right? We were saying last night. Yeah, so I went to Tololo twice okay. in the summer of my junior year at college. So something like 1992. Okay. And then the year after 93. It was either 92 and 93 or 93 and 94 in the US summer Tololo winter. Well, the winters there were lovely. It was so beautiful. I started going there, I think, in 1988, and I did part of my thesis at, on the four meter at Tololo. Wow, that looks so biological, this image. It's like a dead bug. It's not a compliment, is it, Roger? Thank you. I'm always full of compliments like that. But, but you know, I, I think I, I must have gone to Chile 25 times. And one of the things I remember about Tololo is just how dark the skies were. For a really, really, there was no light pollution at all. There were these strange creatures called viscachas that would come out at sunset and watch the, look like they were sitting there watching the sunset, except they were looking for the insects to come out so they could eat them. But there was somewhere between a squirrel and a rabbit. So Lou, you say when you reduce a single frame, when you, you flat field, what do you see on the flat field of, of this, uh, of the narrowband images? I mean, do you see the feature and what's the level of flux that you see relative to the adjacent pixels? Um, I think so. It's a really imposing feature. Like, <laughs> Raj is not kidding about it. Like somebody just it's, squished it's a, a bug. On top of it's the a bug, it's not a feature. There you go. <laughs> Ah, I see you're back to this stage of the night, huh, Raja? That's right. It's getting late <laughs> enough in the night. Uh -huh. Just wait until somebody asks about dark energy versus dark matter, huh? You're going down a dark road, Brian. Right. Oof. Oof. Oh, boy. So that's a that's the flat field. Yeah. That's an asteroid, I'm sure. <laughs> Looks so much like a rock. 
Yeah, it looks like a topo map or something. Prom, uh, that's an asteroid. It looks like a dune worm. Yeah, it kind of looks like it. Pran has an asteroid named after her. And she's discovered a different asteroid, but this one looks like an asteroid. I have an asteroid. What's that? Uh, another another loop. Good, good seeing. No, 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 get another loop. The it's done. So uh, you're moving on to loop three now. Is that right? Uh, yes. I think. Uh, no, I think uh, I'm being the loop three. Okay. Uh, sorry, I don't quite understand. So uh, you're done with loop two now, or no? Uh, now uh, loop two finished. And so we can start loop three? Yeah. Start three. Loop three. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. And sorry, were you mentioning something about the seeing, or did I misunderstand? Four point five. Yeah, no change. No change. That is great. Yeah. No change is great. We'll keep that. Yeah, that defect on the chip sure looks like a deposition failure or something failed to adhere in one of the layers or something like that. So it does not look like we should have sensitivity there, but I don't know, or coding failure. But you see the you see the counts depreciate by quite a bit, right? In the flat field. Like um so yeah, I I mean that is it's a really imposing feature. I think we should really try our best to mitigate it. We're, so they said that it's the edge of the narrow band, but I mean, we're using a different narrow band this time than we were using last night. And you saw the feature last night as well, right? Yeah, it's not, it's not definitely not the filter uh, because I like on their website, they, it's there. Um, Maybe we didn't, I didn't took that very close look. Uh, let me show you that. Um, I'm showing it on the share screen. So this is the website of, of Swim. And here's the right. So you see that structure is already there. That's, that's a broadband filter there, right? That's just the J-band. Yeah, this is J-band. Hmm. Okay, so I, I would say we flip. I would say okay. we flip uh, after, I guess, after loop four, yeah? Yeah. And so we'd have to update the OP file for that? Is that right yeah. inside the summit? Um, yeah, they can, they, can, they can modify it uh, there. Okay. Uh, just uh, the, in the beginning, the get uh, the target, uh, we define the target in the beginning. Um, so we can create an other one, like add a flip. Yep. Uh, so I'll just call it underscore, the PA, underscore flip. Yeah. Yeah. And the PA is 180 degree. Yeah. Okay, great. I will, uh, I'll let them know. Thanks, Lou.
Public exposure. Public exposure. What is this thing we're hearing from time to time that sounds like a child's voice? Is that some kind of echo? So that is... Uh telling us that's an alarm from the telescope letting us know that the exposure has started and Perfect. so we're getting a we're getting a reverberation because we have the sound from the summit and also the sound down here at the base facility so it's saying start exposure Perfect. but yeah it's a child's voice i think <laughs> or somebody with a lot of helium in their system So yeah, Raja, you'll see every time um, you hear that alarm, um, uh -huh. the, the, the dither number, so the one in loose screen that's uh, just to the right of the colon, that number will go up by one. So we've moved the telescope and then we're uh, re-exposing. Which number goes up by one? Sorry, I don't think I'm seeing the... So it's the one, I think the uh, one that just got covered up. <laughs> okay. But yeah, so every time every time that uh, number- Oh yeah, three of nine, I see that. Exactly, yeah. So the number will change um, and this countdown will, will stop and then go back to, to 75 seconds. So we take a 75 second exposure, move the telescope, and then begin the exposure again. Correct. So I'm going to step out for about 10 minutes to uh, run over to Gemini. Uh, I'll be back. Um, Lou or Roy, if, if anything it goes wonky up on the summit. Can you guys jump over to the summit Zoom? Okay. And after you come back, I'm going to bed. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks. I know people have been talking about dithering and if you're, you know, dithering is generally a negative word where you can't make up your mind about something. 
And in astronomy, when you're doing imaging, dithering means you can't make up your mind about where you want to point the telescope. So you point it here, then you point it there, then you point it somewhere else. And, that, and exactly as I think Roy was describing, that it's because all pixels on the silicon detector don't have the same sensitivity. And while you try to correct for that, uh, another way, to, uh, you know, we try to correct for that through a process called, called flat fielding. But another useful thing to do is to take this, you know, your, this way your star of interest lands on different detector pixels each time. So you sort of average that way as well. I just looked up the dictionary definition of dithering. We astronomers have co-opted these terms. Um, you know, every language, I guess every science, every subject co-ops terms. And dithering. Mehul, are you using archival CFHT data or new data? Are we talking to me? No, um, Mehul was uh, put a note in the chat saying near Earth objects. Uh, he's using he's using CFHT to study near Earth asteroids, and I was wondering whether that was archival data or um, new data. Uh, you mean the the broadband we're using? No, you know. Uh, sorry, Lou. I was uh, there was a mention in oh, the chat. Oh, there was a question. Yeah, in the chat. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, I didn't. No, no. Sorry, sorry. I wasn't clear. <laughs> I was mixing my media. There was a question in the chat. I was trying to give an audio answer, or I was asking an audio question. Look at this. Look at this. Got it. You know, we were talking about this uh, artifact on the CCD, mm. and it might be strange for people to see that our images have all these defects in them when you buy an iPhone or Android phone and the images look pristine. And that's because the detectors that we use are not, even though they're similar types of digital detectors with the same underlying technology, they have much larger pixels they're physically much larger and have much higher sensitivity. And so they're typically manufactured more or less one at a time, as opposed to millions of iPhone detectors. And they're just, when they make iPhone CCDs, they test them and the ones that have defects, they throw them out. But these are so expensive to manufacture that we cannot afford to make 20 and throw out 10 of them. So. We get what we get and we don't get upset as my little kids uh, say. They don't practice it, but they say it. From the mouths of babes.
So, uh, someone asked if we have backup sensors. The answer is generally no. So if you have a significant instrument failure, that could be days, weeks, or months, depending on the problem. All these telescopes have multiple instruments available. Usually you can only have <clears throat> one or two mounted on the telescope. Gemini, where Brian works, is interesting. It can have, I think, three or four mounted at the same time, and they can easily swap between them. Some telescopes like Keck or here at Subaru, you can have an instrument at prime focus and an instrument at a different focus, and you could maybe switch once a night between them. But yeah, these instruments are all unique and one off. So I was making the comparison to iPhone detectors, but it's not just the detectors, the actual cameras are all very specialized and large and expensive. So the instrument like Demos that we were using uh, on Keck another night or on Christmas actually, that's like 10 feet long and six feet across. It's a big cylinder instrument that sits on the deck of the teles telescope dome. We're talking about uh, people having this different expertises. So building these astronomical instruments and designing them is a, its own sort of specialty within astronomy. And a, an instrument like this, I don't know what this one costs, but uh, the Keck instruments are typically uh, five to up to almost, Roger will know better perhaps, but like $30 million for the more expensive ones. And that's because every component has to be custom made. You know, there's almost nothing you can, order. well, some cables and wires and things like that, but basically everything else is made at a machine shop at the university or a custom fabricator or things like that. I think it's funny that in movies they still show astronomers looking through telescopes, their eyeballs, sometimes at least. In my professional career going back to the early 90s, I've Never done that except for giving a visit to the public on the 88 inch telescope on Mauna Kea. There was a time they would once a year put an eyepiece on that telescope and you could look through it. They don't do that anymore. Did you see it? Inch? Right. Okay. Did you say 80 inch, like eight zero? Yeah, the 88 inch, the University of Hawaii 88 inch. So that's the first large telescope that was on Mauna Kea. It's still operating. Mm -hmm. um, it opened in about 1970. And it's what, when data started coming from there, that's what really demonstrated Mauna Kea as a superior site. It's just being roboticized now. So they're putting a robotic adaptive optics system on it. But our grad students use it a lot. It's done, done used for a lot of uh, follow-up with PanSTARS discoveries. And I've observed with it many times. Not in a while, but. Mm -hmm. Oh, someone's asking, what is it to get into a 
astronomy. So James, I see your question. We'll, we can get to that uh, in a little bit. So to get go to a career in astronomy, at least in the United States, um, and mo most uh, parts of the world that I know, is you go to college, and then you have to go get a graduate degree, a PhD, what we call a PhD, and um, and then it's still challenging to get a long-term position. The things that you need to do are be good at math, be good at computers. And I, one of the things I think about is to be creative, so to have good ideas. And also, depending on the kind of astronomy you're doing, to be careful so that you pay, uh, good at paying attention. Roger, do you know the average seeing on Mauna Kea? Probably about half an arc second, maybe 0.6. I would have guessed uh, more in the optical. I would have guessed more like 0.8 in the optical, but I don't know. On Mauna, well, I suppose it depends on the site because CFHT gets, that ridge gets better seeing than uh, What's the question about Mauna Kea overall? Median from, here's a, Subaru says 0.65. Okay. Is that for a particular telescope or? That came from Subaru. Subaru. Okay. He said when I put in Mauna Kea median seeing and I got some from a web page at Subaru. Okay. I think it's slightly worse than that at Keck and better at CFHD possibly. Yeah, yeah, but some energy. He claims that the atmospheric seeing is 0.4 at seconds. Wow. Which I can attest to because I have taken data in the, in the optical at 0.4, even 0.38, I think is the best I've ever seen in Keck. Invisible. Yeah, so James, last night we were doing spectroscopy. Tonight, this, this project is a little bit complicated, but last night we were looking at the same field as we were looking with Keck. Pictures by star forming galaxies. That's what we're doing tonight, but for a slightly different project. So these can emission lines, so bright emission in a narrow wavelength range, and we're trying to identify those. You don't get quite the same exact detail about them as you get with spectroscopy, but you can map a bigger area and uh, and see where there are star forming galaxies. So it's just a different approach to the same to similar problem. Okay, so James, let me. Lou, are you um, okay to check them for the next loop? Uh, yeah, I can do that. I will stop the sharing um, if that's okay too. Yeah. So actually what I will do is, oh, wait for you to stop and then, all right, now I'll share mine. Let me see if I can find it. So um, this uh, part of the figure here, you can see there's wavelengths in nanometers across the bottom and flux or the transmission. So this blue curve shows one of the filters we were using last night on Subaru. Um, and the red curve is the other filter we were using. So this camera actually takes pictures, has two separate sides that can take pictures of two different filters at the same time. And this bluer filter, which is uh, at 1.3 microns or 1300 nanometers 
corresponds to singly ionized oxygen at the redshift of the structure we were looking at last night. Okay. And this other filter just so happens to correspond to doubly ionized oxygen. And both of those features, emission features, are um, produced in forming galaxies. So if the object looks bright in these narrow band filters, but in broad band filters that cover a much broader wavelength range, uh, they don't show up, then they're probably star forming galaxies at this redshift. So we're using this same trick with these narrow band filters to try to see if there are galaxies in another part of this nearby part of the sky where people have identified absorption from hydrogen gas but have not seen lots of galaxies. So we're trying to see if there is a mysterious big agglomeration of gas. Once this done, we can do another one. Galaxies before. Oh, Agapio, so I'm sure there's, Mauna Kea has been studied extremely expense, extensively and expensively um, for its um, conditions. So probably you can just get that answer from uh, Google for those metrics. So Gemini says that the sky at Mauna Kea is fainter than 20.8 magnitudes per square arc second for half the time. Can we do another loop? No. Thank you. And is that uh, so? We're gonna have another pointing. So it's this. It's the same pointing, but less. Oh, I, I didn't have that in the OPE file. Um, so can you help us to uh, create one there? And so Lou, the, the plan is to do one loop at this 180 degree flip at this pointing, right? Yeah, I think if everything goes well, we can do six. You do six total, so two of this new flipped pointing. Two, yeah. Okay, so we'll do four of the original position angle and then two of the 180 degree flip, and then we'll do the same thing for the second pointing. Yes, yes. We, we may as well go three and three tonight, and then uh, just in case something happens a different night um, and we're not able to complete it so that at least we get half and half uh, for the second pointing. For the second pointing, half and half? Yeah, we can yeah. go three and three. If we have enough time, we'll do six and we can go three and three. Yeah. I think we probably oh, can cover like six for pointing one and five for pointing two. Oh, yeah, five for pointing two. What does uh, everything go for? What time do you have us going up until for the science observations without the standard? 6.20. You have us observing? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Whoa. Okay, so uh, 12 degree, if I remember well from last night, is like 6.08 or something like that? Yeah. So we go way past 12 degree with our science observation? Yeah. Whoa, okay. That's surprising. Yeah, but luckily at the final frame, you guys think the background is getting higher. So I'm sure yeah. it's worth taking. Yeah, yeah, because normally when we're observing with moss fire, past 12 degree, you're doing a little bit better in the morning than you are at the evening, but past 12 degree, it's it's really bright. Yeah. That's yeah, right. the problem of the thunder star is it takes a long time to for the telescope to screw to it. Mm -hmm. All that kind of it's a big telescope. Yeah. So um, like last night, I decided to not to take the standard side. Oh, okay. 
because uh, one is the, uh, the green is very similar to the uh, the night before. Um, and like everything goes well. While I reduce the data, I do use the standard star for now and for more snow. Okay. I um uh, I honestly think I so not for the reason that you said, but I honestly think we can get away with this because we are observing in the cosmos field. And so we have so much um, so we know things, you know, are are not like, for example, stars in the field are not going to be uh, excess in the in the passion beta filter relative to you know H band observations that already exist in Cosmos. So we can do the same calibration that we did with works before uh, for going a standard star. So I think that that's fine because in the end you just yeah um, in the end you just uh, do do a standard on a grouping of objects and you forget about the standard star. So I'm I'm totally comfortable not taking a standard star for that reason. Um, I, I wouldn't say that the seeing being the same is necessarily a good reason to do that. Um, yeah. it, I think we have photometric conditions and uh, we've had it for the entire time. So really lucky. So that's another good reason that we might get away with one standard. But ultimately, we're even if we took a standard every night, we would post process this with um, with photometry in the cosmos field, just like we did before with Marks. So I, I think it's I think it's totally fine. But I, I would suggest we we monitor the sky brightness over time. Um, so starting maybe at um, around six o'clock and we start to see where it gets pretty bright and then we just stop there because I, I think this okay. the, the background is gonna get pretty ridiculous at some point. Yeah, I, I didn't have time to check the data, but I can do that really quick. Okay, we can also just check. I mean, it, it doesn't hurt anything taking those frames. I mean, we're not finding anything else with the telescope, but um, it does. It, it probably is not helping. So we can we can check tonight and just get a, a basic gauge of how how late we can go, and that can kind of set our plans for the next two nights as well to know what we can fit yeah. in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, six ten is fine. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, the other thing I was thinking of as I was walking back from Gemini is that I think it would be ludicrous at this point to try to go for breadth. So I think it's a bad idea to not go to full depth. And the reason for this is because if we, if we not because we necessarily need the depth, I don't know that, but we need that feature taken out. And we will have no flip data at this point for four of the pointings. So assuming everything goes well tonight, four of our pointings, all four of our pointings in Hyperion will not have a flipped PA, which means that this, this large artifact will be affecting a considerable portion of the field, given that it's larger by quite a bit than our dither pattern. Yeah. So when we median combine the data, it's uh, we're, we're going to have some serious issues if we don't do a flip observation. So do you think it's, it's much it could be better if we have a larger dealer pattern. I think I think flipping is going to serve the same purpose, so I I think it's okay. Um, I given that these are fairly small field of view uh, for swims, I I wouldn't want to go too much bigger, and we would have to go like a little bit larger than the feature size in the detector, which would mean dithering by almost an arc minute and that's that's not a good idea <laughs> that's really not a good idea, not a good idea. yeah so we're gonna that we would introduce some other differential depth effects by just by virtue of doing that so that's that's not a good idea and uh, i was i was speaking with ichi who i think probably came in here at some point and he confirmed that that is an actual uh, defect on the detector so it, it doesn't have anything to do with the bandwidth you know, so. So I think that, that that sets our observing plan because, and you know, assuming everything goes well, I think that that sets our observing plan. Mm -hmm. I don't think we have, we have a choice anymore. Yeah. But we made the right decision okay. for tonight. We made the right decision because we we did end up going with the two pointing strategy with lattice rather than the four, four pointing strategy, which would have which would have caused us to not be able to come back to. Of the Hyperion observations. 
Yeah. Good that you're here and decide that. Um, cool. So that makes our job a lot easier because the swims detector decided for us. It wasn't me that made the decision. It was the swims detector that decided for us. <laughs> so I take no credit for that. Um, yeah. Okay. Sounds good. So, uh, so after this loop, we'll we'll do the flip, and then we'll try to go for. So you had three and three plan, or three and two plan for um, the second pointing to move us to six twenty or so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we'll go three and two then. All right, Brian. Do yeah. I'm gonna go for it. Okay, I will go over to uh, Link and uh, carry it off again. Um, yep. Brian, could you tell the people at the at the Yeah, I'll, I'll yeah, I'll talk to them. No worries. Yeah, I got it. Okay, thanks everyone. Thanks to everyone who joined us. I have to wake up in four hours to get my kids to school. So um, thank you, Roy, for joining us. Yep, that was fun. That was super fun to have you here. The, uh, um, at the Shadow the Scientist stuff. So thank you all for joining us. We'll do more of these in the future. Or other astronomers will do more of these in the future. We don't have any observing nights for a little while after this week, right? So but I think Raj is going to start up again in February. So there won't be too much of a lag. And then uh, Marusha's group is going to do it. So yeah, we'll definitely have some some other events coming up soon. But for now, maybe get some sleep, right? Since it's your second night in a row of getting four hours or less than sleep. This is actually going to be nice. Roy, thank you for including me, and uh, I'll I'll reach out to you. Uh, maybe we'll set up a Zoom call with Brian just just to strategize about you know what went well, what what we might do differently in the future. Yeah, and I, I would like to advertise this to people at IFA know that this is happening. So Excellent. since we have all the telescopes we. I think one thing we'll definitely have to think about is how to coordinate with the observatories to get them sort of. Right. Yeah, let's, let's, there are several things I'm thinking about that we've done differently. You know, for example, we assign specific blocks of time, not the whole night uh, for STS. That's one of the things we might consider. Anyway, we can talk about it. And uh, I should have some, should be able to provide some logistical support for this, meaning event planning support, some. Um, astronomy expertise support to you know sort of to help ease the burden on the people running the experiment yeah, and i can do that too from the hawaii side that'd be great that would be terrific okay thank you again for including me you. really appreciate it all right good night good night And I see uh, Sara has a hand raised. Is that an accident or do you have a question, Sara? Sounds like it might be an accident. Brian, I have something for you. What's that? I'll put it in the chat. You misspelled it. Roger. No, I don't. That's what it's meant to be a uh, pun. Yes, I'm joking. Uh, none of the answer? other transitions give a give a good pun though. Sorry. To, none of the other transitions make a good pun. You're bracketing me in here. I don't know what else to. Oh, no, that's true. Yeah, that's true. I don't know how to make a comeback. Yeah, NSF funding. Isn't there a fun series after the? Fashion series after bracket i think yeah oh yeah yeah that's right it's the let's see it's lyman Bama, fashion 
bracket and then fund. Yeah. Oh, fund. Yeah. Well, luckily we're not observing any of those tonight, so. True. We don't have to anger you, Raja. No, you don't. Oh, there, was, there was another good one in the in the chat there by Michal. He's asking, he or she's asking you to be truthful, Roger. Don't lie, man. Yes, exactly. Very good. Very good. Hey, Andrew. You guys hear me at the summit? Yeah. Mehul, your pun was in the top bracket. Um, so we're going to do a, I don't know if uh, you caught what Lou mentioned earlier, but we were going to do a flip on this pointing. And we were hoping that you guys could stick it in the OPE file. So after this loop, then we would flip uh, 180 degrees and then do two uh, loops at that, at that orientation. OK, OK. Um, I'm not an expert on the swim syntax, so I'm going to Grab the uh, support to start working. Okay, thanks. Move it, move We have some chain on the point. Yeah, so for the for this pointing that we're on now, we were hoping to flip 180 degrees. And this would be for the next loop and the following loop. So for loops four and five. Uh, so same RA deck center, just 180 degrees flip. So PA of 180. And the same, uh, we would like to do the same also with, um, with pointing two. Okay. PA change? Just a PA change, yes. Ryan, one more for you in the chat. Move 
So uh, were you guys able to get that clip in? Well, have you checked whether the field of view is correct? You're talking to, you're talking to me? Uh, I don't know the public uh, play of this. Yeah, that's so heavy that for that dollar. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So you, so, Shuhei, you, turn, you flip the position now by 180 degrees, right? Um, I'm going to you mean? You are asked to flip, rotate the position angle by 180 degrees, right? So this, this is after this current loop. So hopefully we're still at the same position angle for this loop. And then I think have we been we're going to flip by 180 degrees, right? Yeah, after this loop, yes. See the evening data currently. Hey Brian, can you tell them to uh, make a new one? I think we better change not until make a new target. The current file. Also, this is a backup. It's uh, different position angle. So this is um yeah. If you guys can just modify. Shui, if you can modify this to add another pointing, just to call it like backup uh, underscore flip yeah, or something. Yeah, or yeah, flip is better, I think. Yeah, and so and so we want to keep this one still the same because we may come back to it. Um, and so then just yeah, add this yeah. other one, uh, which is at PA one eighty, um, and then we'll go to that after after the, the next two exposures after this loop is finished. All right. So basically, just cut and paste, and then flip one eighty. That's all. And the same thing for P2 underscore backup. So I see, I see there's a, a couple of questions in the chat about why we're doing the thing that we're doing right now, asking them to flip 180 degrees. Um, so if, if everybody can see in the top left of a uh, loose screen here, there's this, this giant artifact. So this giant thing that looks like a squish bug or, or something, uh, it's a Rorschach test basically. Um, and that's actually physically on the detector. So there's an, there's an issue with the detector. And so, uh, somebody astutely mentioned that 180 degrees flip, it's going to look the same in the sky. But we're actually rotating the detector around 180 degrees so that artifact is going to move on the other part of our observation and so we're going to hopefully we hope we're going to average it out so meaning that we're moving the telescope um this dithering uh pattern that raja mentioned earlier which is good for telescopes we're moving the telescope around so that we can kind of average this out but this feature is really big and so our movements are fairly small compared to the size of this feature and so by rotating around 180 degrees, um, we'll do, you know, half of our observations where the features on the other side of the, the sky are our field of view. Um, and so it won't be as bad in our image. This artifact won't show up as bad in our image because we're able to average it out and move it across uh, our field of view. So we can move the detector. We can't move the sky. <laughs> But we we have the ability to move the detector, and so that's what we're going to do to try to mitigate this issue. はい、
なんか、結局、僕もわかんないですけど。<笑>そもそもバックアップという名前で、えー、と先輩の予想を書いてっていう最初,最初からね、最初から、一応の監督先輩はアンダーバーバックアップをやってくださいってことで、これの180度改正したのが欲しいですよね。だから、そうそう、そのはずだと。And Shui, you may want to call this uh, Lattice1BF for a short name so we can differentiate it. Yeah, that's that's perfect for us. No, I think it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. And so uh, as soon as this exposure is done, we're happy to go there. And then um, and then we do the same with 2B when when we have a chance. So Michal, you, you asked a question about the image being flipped on the vertical axis. That's exactly right. So we're going to mirror the image on the top left. And so um, the artifact, which was affecting just below those, so it's actually to the south of those kind of four stars on the right-hand side there, um, we're going to take that the good detector, so the, the left detector, we're going to stick it over there. So there'll be no effect in that region of the sky, but that defect will move over to the other region of the sky. So um, there's actually no stars visible there in the image, but uh, if there were stars exactly mirrored along the vertical axis there, those would go away in, in these images, but that's kind of the point so that we average it out. Oh, wait, wait. Never mind. It's some, maybe it's less. Yes. The target came to the uh, fleet squadron. So you guys just moved back to the original pointing center and you did the flip of 180 and the flip is going on right now. So I see there was a question in the chat about uh, how much time it takes for a project to finish. I'm curious if um, 
if maybe Lou or Ekta could could speak on this since they have recently finished projects. Um, Ekta recently finished her PhD and and Lou finished her PhD about two years ago. But um, how uh, like how what's the development of the time scale of a project and uh, <laughs> what are the, the kind of bumps along the road and and what do you do? So maybe Ekta, could could you speak to that at all? Sure. Um, so uh, I don't know exactly who asked the question, but uh, if you are a student, uh, I just want to make a clear distinction. So in the usual studies, you know, when you are for most of the courses or most of the degree courses, it's the course is usually limited to the books, right? And the syllabus is limited to whatever is in your book. Um, the difference between that and PhD is PhD is for most part of your PhD, you're doing research and that's new stuff. And uh, so in many ways, uh, you know, uh, in some ways you have, you have the, uh, it's your responsibility and it's up to you to define like how large of a project you want to take. So let's say, uh, you know, if I have some data, so for my PhD, I studied the effects of galaxy interactions and mergers on their star formation rate and black hole activity. So I had I I, I, I already had some data, and then uh, me and my advisor had kind of planned out uh, like what we want to do at what stage, and we had rough plan about what each of those uh, steps would get, will be take, how much time will be taken for each of those steps. And the thing is like. You know, if you're doing PhD properly, you will be doing, you will be trying something new. So there will be bumps on the road and, uh, you know, you will try out some methods and some of that will work and some of that will not work. So, you know, we have a saying like things are always going to take longer than you estimate. So, uh, so yeah, so uh, for, for my first project. Uh, uh, we, uh, we could probably, uh, let's check real quick. Maybe a, maybe a short exposure to check. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Lou, I guess you have a finding chart for this. We can just flip it in our heads, but I think we've seen this asterism enough that we can probably check, 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 check. that we can probably pick it out pretty quick. Yeah. That seems that seems right. Yep, yep. I see the two stars. Yeah, no, that looks perfect. Yeah, let's let's go ahead with that. Lou, you concur? Yeah. Yeah, that looks that looks good. So we're ready to go. Thanks, guys. Okay, I'll, I'll continue. Oh. Yeah, please feel free, Akta. Yeah. So uh, for my first project, I was basically extending the some of the methods that were done in the local universe, and I was extending those methods to study high redshift universe, so very early universe, and you know that that came with its own challenges. So it took me about three and a half years uh, to you know find like actually develop the method properly. And after that, I finished my second project, which was using similar data, but instead of studying the black hole activity of galaxies, I studied the star formation rate in galaxies. So that only took me like one additional year. And then in that year, I also studied uh, the same things like effects of galaxy interactions and mergers on their star formation and black hole, black hole activity. But instead of using observations, I used cosmological simulations. And uh, because I had already developed methods right. using observations.
You're okay, Akta. Okay. Uh, so be because I had already developed my method using observations, uh, I was able to complete the second observation project as well as same projects using simulations. So to overall total three projects in just one year while completing my PhD. So, uh, and, and uh, so it really depends on your project and how much you want to you know, include in your dissertation or include in your final project. And I kind of joke with my friends, like, uh, uh, you know, usually somebody would be like, oh, like somebody couldn't finish a project, a PhD in like five years, like, why is it taking so long, you know? But as I said initially, like, it's up to you how much you want to include. And in many ways, when you're towards the end of your PhD, it's not like you are towards the end of the project. It's more like you have more and more opportunities to expand. So imagine like, you know, you are in some dark corridor and then suddenly you take a turn and then there are your favorite stuff. Like, if, you know, like I like flowers. So imagine more and more flowers there. And then you are only given like, you know, five minutes to grab as many flowers as you can. But then the more forward you go, the better flowers you find. So you're like, I also want this and I also want that. It's similar for PhD as well, because like when you're towards the end of your PhD, you have already done so much. And it's just, if you just do a little bit more, you will be able to expand it even further. So at that point, it's like, uh, you know, include as much as you can. So that's why it becomes difficult to like wrap it much sooner, but that's what makes it awesome. Like you have, you can do so many new stuff and that's what makes it worth it. And, uh, you know, worth your time and worth your efforts. So, yeah, I hope that kind of answers your question. <laughs> And and really the job's never done, right, Akta? Because as you say, you see you see more and more uh, beautiful and complex flowers as you go along. Your vision also improves, so you you have better instruments that you use, but also your your mind is able to interpret the the, the structure of those flowers in a way that you weren't able to two or three years ago when you started. And so you you just finished your PhD not too long ago, but but finishing is just a start because now you're joining our research group and you're expanding out into a, a, a still grounded in what you were doing before but expanding out into even more complex science and, and from many different perspectives now that that you potentially weren't doing before so um so th the answer is probably that it's never finished <laughs> And you spend an entire career doing it, and then and then somebody else takes over afterwards. And maybe you've answered a, a few questions if you're lucky, but then uh, but then there's even even better questions that that your research has allowed for. Sure. Yeah, I agree with Acta that uh, it really depends on what your expectation and ambitious. And, uh, and I found that in the beginning of the PhD, the graduate student study, uh, it took a long, very long time to even read a paper. I think uh, like pretty also like, uh, like said uh, that's, that. That's because you were reading that, my papers, right? Not only yours, but <laughs> like Laurie's. <laughs> like our groups, the, uh, the paper is very long. And sometimes like the, the words, it's just, okay, I don't understand. I'm just not following the sentence. It's very easy to get lost in the beginning. Um, but when like you read more and more and uh, like we, I do a more like myself, it, like experience more in the data and anal analysis, I found it's much easier to read and this, the like I, I found reading paper is easier when I finished one paper um so at that point I feel like okay I can read one paper really quick like like go through it like just understanding it uh, get the main idea um that's easier when you finish one paper um and yeah the first my I've done three projects uh in my uh, PhD but it's a it's a it's a series. Uh, so the first paper is using or like uh, already reduced the data, radio data. Uh, I'm doing radio. Uh, uh, I'm, my my focusing is environmental effect on galaxy evolution, and I'm using radio data as a tracer uh, to the whole uh, galaxy group. But 
uh, their radio emitter. Um, so the first project is using archival data. And then the, the, the second one is also using archival data. But in the meantime, I'm reducing new data, um, uh, our own data taken from VLA. Um, that's a very large array, uh, something like that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, very large array. Um, it's amazing uh, radio telescope. Um, so while I'm doing the first two projects, I'm also reducing the third one, uh, the, the more data, and that's came to the my third project. So the first one took a long time, and then the second one, third one is is much quicker. Uh, like I forgot the initial question. <laughs> do actor, do you remember what's the question? <laughs> For us, it was something like how long does a project take? Oh yeah, okay. The first one took me like two year, one year, two and one and a half. The second one took like one and a half. The third one just took like half year, and the third, uh, the third one took half year, and the fourth also like half year. Yeah, so it's getting quicker. <laughs> Also, um, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Are you guys oh, restarting just... the detector controller or something now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. It's not recording the, yeah, it, it stays there for a while, probably. Okay. It stays for a minute. Okay. So, Lou, we were having an issue here. The If you see the most recent frames, the detector is not reading out very well. So, when we rotated, something happened with the detector readout. So, they're now restarting the detector controller. Okay. <laughs> there was some issue with the detector yesterday as well, right? Like with readout. Yeah, in the beginning, I think. I see Roy's note that in the beginning, like there's readout problem. Yeah, so I think that the last set of frames was um, was no good. じゃあ、あの、テクシオンにします。はい。テクシオンにします。ロックアウトプット ゼロ、ゼロ、ゼロ。はい、じゃあこれでちょっとパワーアップしてください。ちょっと待ってください。ちょっと待ってください。ちょっと待ってください。ちょっと待ってください。ちょっと待ってください。ちょっと待ってください
Oh, that looks very good. Yeah, okay. Good Good Hi, Brian. Yes. Do you mind ask them like to screw up the uh, frames? Just let me see which frame is bad um, so I can write it down. What's the, the scroll, frame I to Scroll down on the frame screen or what? Uh, scroll up the frames. So um so I can see like like I can see which frame is bad. Like I why why reduce the data I will take uh, I will take a look them like remove them. Sure, but which uh like how, how are you able to tell? Um because I see so you're talking about the frame screen on the fourth BNC window that uh, the frame the prefix is SWSB. Yeah, yeah. Or you can ask them, they, they may know. Okay. Guys, do you happen to know which frames were the, the bad ones? Where the detector uh, didn't read out well? Frame number? Yeah, the number. Yeah, the number. Eight nine one from nine two eight nine one nine two eight nine one nine two nine seven one up uh blue arm and one zero two seven eight one two one zero two nine five one up later on. Did you get all that Lou? Yeah, I can see that in the in the in the in the one of the uh, uh, BNC. Yep.
So I could see a fixed pattern in the CCD a little while ago. Is that some kind of doping pattern? Look like rings. Yeah, yeah, I see it too, Raja. Yeah, I'm not sure. I can sort of see it here, yeah. The ring. Right, Brian. Yeah, these sort of like look like rings at the lower left, you see? Um, yeah, I think this is something due to the filter. I think I think it's due to the doping pattern on the detector. I think we were just told that it was from OH airglow lines. Oh, okay, fringing. Uh, this is the pattern caused fringing. by the filter, uh, medium down filter in this I see. So the fil it's fringing in the filter, is it? Yeah, fringe caused by the filter. Yeah. I see. Yeah, that's correct, Roger. Yeah. So I'm having a little bit. Brian, I have a good. Uh, I have a one liner for you. It's not good, but it's a one liner. Okay. Yeah, I'll just put it in the chat. So you're going to be here all night, Raja? Sorry? You're going to be here all night? Is that right? I don't think so. I don't know how much longer because I, I have a 10 a.m. meeting in the morning. Do you want to just do stand, start your stand-up routine now or... Uh, I'm already work? doing my sit down routine. That's right. Ah, okay. Okay. You know, I, I, I have been sitting in this spot in the couch for the last two years and my family, the shape in the couch has lovingly referred to by my family as the great depression. Uh, there you go. There's my sit down routine. Yep. Perfect. Um, I'll reach out to you, Brian, about the planning going forward. Uh, while this is still fresh, be good to chart. Okay, that sounds good. We still have a, a, a whole, I mean, we have a big group, 55 people right now. So we had a couple of um, couple of questions in the chat while we were doing some telescope stuff. So I see somebody asked, why don't galaxies have a natural magnetic field like the Earth does? Um, so actually they do have, so the, the interstellar medium, so the space in between stars, there is, a presence of magnetic field there. And actually, before I started working with Raja um, at UC Santa Cruz, I worked with a professor there named Stephen Thorsett looking at um, uh, pulsar, so dead star, uh, signals from dead stars. And we were looking at um, what's called rotation measures, which were induced um, by magnetic fields um, in between the pulsar and uh, when we received the light on Earth. So there's a lot of physics actually um, that um, people simulate in simulations of, of galaxies that try to reproduce these magnetic fields and then see what the consequences of uh, these magnetic fields are for the emission in galaxies. Um, and so this is a really open, I think it's one of the most under-constrained problems in modern astrophysics is, is what these magnetic fields look like um, in galaxies and how they affect the evolution of the galaxies. Can I add one quick thing about uh, the discussion on the project's lens and stuff? Um, yeah, please. 
So uh, I just wanted to say that, uh, you know, the projects me and Lou discussed, they were uh, for our PhD dissertation. So, uh, you know, you can also have projects that are well suited for like high school students or college students or, you know, uh, like almost anybody with some educational background and some training. So uh, when you define project, it's like, you know, what question are you asking? So sometimes we already have a question like, we want to study how galaxies grow over time. And sometimes you already have data and you want to know how much more you can study using that data, right? So when you imagine if you already have data, then you can start with something simple, right? Oh, how does this quantity vary with this quantity or how does this quantity grow over time or something? So, uh, so you can ask some simple questions that can be, you know, studied, that can be, uh, I guess, resolved based on some very uh, basic experience with programming or even basic experience, even basic math sometimes. So, uh, so that's why like the length of the project will depend on your question and will depend on how you wanna design it. So yeah, don't feel that, you know, all the projects are like, like take years or something. You can have a smaller project and you can also have projects that are like, you know, career long that are like mysteries. So uh, yeah, so there is quite a range. Exposure, exposure. So I see there was also a question about the hardest thing about doing while doing a project. Um, I'm sure like the most famous or the most interesting astronomical discovery, we could all have different answers to this question and argue over it. Uh, I noticed that Preeti mentioned coding as being a really hard part of doing a project. That's certainly true for me as well. So um, writing code and, and doing it in a way that um, gets to what you want in a, in a reasonable uh, amount of time and just trying to conceptualize what kind of tools you need for the project is is probably one of the hardest parts. So um, not only coding, but which telescopes you need, which kind of observations do you need, but also what are the questions that you're trying to answer? And as you start to take these observations, so you may think, okay, one tool or one, um, one code that I've written is really, really good for a certain type of, of question. So I have a question like, you know, how many, what's the magnetic field in this galaxy or how many stars are being formed in this galaxy. And so you start to write something and you think, oh, I'm really smart for having written this thing. And I, you know, I got time on this really big telescope and I'm taking these observations, which should really help me. But the universe always surprises you. There's always different ways of, of looking at the problem or you find yourself interested in something else. So it, it, uh, it comes to light as you're um, observing or as you're running your code that that maybe that's not the right question to ask. And so then you have to adapt to that and you have to get different observations uh, and then you need to use, because time on the telescope is very precious. So you need to use um, all of those observations together to, to answer um, both your original question and new question. So keeping grounded in, in what you're doing, um, where you're headed and, and what's what's interesting to you and what are the questions that you're trying to ask is important, but then also being open and being adaptable um, so that, you know, you're not imposing on the universe, you know, your understanding and your that your question is the right ones, but rather that 
um, you, you listen to the universe, what it's telling you, and you then start to, you know, create tools and, and do different observations to lead in the path that, that it's kind of leading you. So I think that that balance is one of the hardest things in any scientific discipline, um, because that's not just unique to astronomy, of course. Um, but there's there's plenty of other hard things. <laughs> uh, so giving talks, I think, is, is a, so trying to tell people what what it is that you found is is very is very um, complicated. So I mean, of course, these observations we start with the the idea um, to take some observations on on the Subaru telescope. Then we have to convince people that that those observations are actually worthwhile. And then we plan for many, many days to take these observations. And then we sit here at 3.27 in the morning, taking these observations. Um, and, then, and then we have to analyze them, uh, see what they mean in terms of the questions that we asked. And then we have to present them to people so that everybody knows what we found. And so that process um, takes a lot of different skills and it's, it can be very hard at first, um, but over time, it, uh, you can develop the skills to be able to to do each one of those stages uh, effectively and then to to present your knowledge what, what knowledge you've gained to the world so that other people can use it and then ask even better questions themselves i just wanted to chime in on something preeti said at the end there i 100 percent resonate with that science is a team sport it's not an individual effort and i hope people who are eavesdropping on this experiment can see that it's totally a team sport. There's a team at, uh, that's helping run the telescope at Subaru. You know, there's a team of scientists on the Zoom call. There are other people who are not on this call right now who will contribute. It's it very much a team sport. Yeah, so if you look at any scientific paper, um... In, in the astronomy community, it's very it's very rare that you see just a single author writing a paper. Uh, a lot of times, it's going to be um, at a minimum five six people that are all working together that are taking different observations that have different expertise um, and that work together to try to make a coherent picture of the observations or the the theory that they're that they're working on. And so, um, I think the communication between what seems to be like disparate fields of, of science or astrophysics can also be a very challenging part of the process. So uh, if you're really used to studying like stars and then, and then you're working with somebody who's used to studying galaxies, um, trying to make a communication between uh, those the two sets of, of knowledge um, can be very, very challenging, but very worthwhile. Um, and that's, in fact, where a lot of really good discoveries come from is people coming from very disparate areas and, and getting together, working together as a team and, and through by virtue of the different perspectives, being able to answer questions that they would never be able to answer alone. I see we're getting a lot of questions here, <laughs> probably more than we can keep up with. Um, okay, so uh, there was a question about galaxies looking stationary and why, why do we say that they rotate? So um, this is a project that we've, so we can't do that this evening because we're not using a technique called spectroscopy, um, which is what we used last night on the Keck telescope for the, our Shadow of the Scientist event. Um, but when you, when you look with spectroscopy, you break up light into its constituent parts so you have um, uh, you're able to see um, an entire spectrum of light so thinking about like a prism you see all the way from blue to red um, from a galaxy and you can actually if you if you place an observation in such a way that you look at one part of the galaxy versus another part of the galaxy and it's oriented in such a way that um, uh, so if you think of a spiral galaxy if it's facing right towards you so that you can see the whole the whole galaxy so probably pictures you've seen of like the milky way um, or they're supposed to be of the milky way they'll it'll look like a big grand design spiral that's face on looking right at you 
Um, that's of course not the Milky Way because we don't have cameras out there, um, but that's the idea. So that's a face-on spiral. And then you have an edge-on spiral. So where it, it looks real thin like a pancake. And so if you have something like that and you are able to orient your observations such that you're able to see both sides of that galaxy, you can actually measure the Doppler shift. So the shift in light um, from one side of the galaxy to the other side of the galaxy and you can measure the rotational speed of that galaxy. And so um, a lot of galaxies are measured to have rotational speeds 100, 200 kilometers per second. So very, very fast rotation on, on our human scale, of course, on gal galactic scales, that's very, very slow. And so when you take a picture, um, even 200 kilometers per second, you know, you take a picture, let's say two hours apart, that's 7,200 seconds, you'd think, oh, that's a, that's a really big movement but galaxies are very large. And so you don't actually see them change on a human time scale. So you can only measure that with the, with the spectrograph. And Brian, you may have said this already, but the sun takes 200 million years to go around the Milky Way once, 200 million years. And that's, you know, that's a pretty typical number for uh, the rotation period of a galaxy. That's why you don't see them in a human lifetime. You don't see them change. Sorry to interrupt, but does that make sense? Yeah, no, thanks Raja for clarifying that. Um, yeah, so it's a really long time. <laughs> so pictures, pictures are just, you're just getting a snapshot. And so um, when, we're, when we're looking at things in astronomy, we wanna take snapshots of, of different things at different times, at different distances, because things aren't gonna change on it. Well, there's a few things in astronomy that do. We talked about one of them last night called the tidal disruption event. But on human time scales, not a lot happens out in the universe. So we need to take pictures of different distances, which are traveling back in time, and then try to make uh, a picture of how, let's say, a model of how uh, those pictures connect to one another. So it's kind of like archaeology. And uh, one other thing I was going to say, Brian, is a good way to think of why it takes the sun to go, I mean, a good way to, to order a magnitude calculation. The sun is located 25,000 light years from the center of the Milky Way. So light traveling in a straight line would take 25,000 years. If it were just traveling from the sun, if the sun were traveling straight towards the center of the galaxy at the speed of light, it would take 25,000 years to get there. Now, of course, the sun isn't traveling in a straight line to the center of the galaxy, it's going in a circle. So instead of r, you have to multiply by two pi, which is about six. So instead of 25, it now takes 150 or 200,000 light years. Now that's traveling at the speed of light, 200,000 years traveling at the speed of light. The sun's speed is 1,000th the speed of light, 1,000 times smaller than the speed of light. So instead of taking 200,000, it takes 200 million years to go around. Sorry if that was quick, but that's a, uh, order of magnitude way to calculate how long it takes a galaxy to spin. Thanks, Raja. Okay, so um, yeah, quite a, quite a few questions here. Um, the closest star, so uh, Raja just mentioned the closest star, that's the sun. Um, so that's about eight light minutes away. Um, the next closest star is Alpha Centauri, and I think that's about four light years away, something like that. So it takes about four years for the light for Alpha Centauri to arrive here at Earth. So if Alpha Centauri blew up today, we wouldn't we wouldn't know that until 2026. Um, so that's pretty far away. <laughs> so we we're kind of uh, a little bit alone here in this in the solar system. So. It's a good reason to make the best of it. And then there was another question about Pluto being a planet. According to the official astronomy dogma, Pluto is not a planet. It's something called a dwarf planet. Um, it used to be a planet, designated as a planet, but um, about, mm, I would say, 10 years ago or so at the International Astronomical Union Conference, they decided that there's this new class of objects in the solar system called a dwarf planet, of which Pluto is, I believe, the largest. Um, and so right now it's, it's currently classified as a dwarf planet, not a planet.
Yeah. So there was a good question here uh, for Blue and Ekta uh, from Marcin about in the end, is it worth the struggle that you have for your for your project, or is it? I mean, would you be here tonight if it was not worth the struggle? I mean, it's absolutely worth it. <laughs> oh. Obviously, I'm here and I have been here, you know, I have been observing for like past week, even past week or more, um, even though I'm like visiting my family after four years, you know, and each second is totally worth it. So I think, uh, but I know, I know people uh, who joined PhD and later on, they found out that it's not for you. It's not for them. So I think what I would suggest is, um, you know, a lot of times, especially in astronomy, uh, people would like look at pretty images of galaxies and, uh, you know, they will find it fascinating and they would be like, I want to do this. And uh, when you actually do astronomy, like for your research, you realize that for most times you're not actually staring at just pretty pictures of galaxies, right? For most part, you are kind of doing coding as Brian and Lou mentioned. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's important to realize like whatever field you want to uh, kind of join as a kid, join for your career, uh, it's important to realize like what do people who actually have that profession do uh, for their day-to-day -day stuff, do for their day-to-day -day work. And for that, at least for research, you can, you know, try to see if you have like opportunities to uh, join like undergraduate research during your undergrad or something. And then that will at least give you some idea about uh, whether or not research is for you or whether or not, let's say, astro is for you. So I would strongly suggest Sorry, to get uh, like that. Yeah. Sorry, Akta, I need to talk to Brian for a second. Yeah, sorry. Um, We're going to do another so Brian, loop. I always uh, want to ask you that. If if we do another loop on this uh, 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 pointing, yes. then we may not uh, like have five total for the other pointing. OK, and this is our this is our fifth loop, correct? So we had four at the yes. other position angle, and then this would be the fifth. Okay, yeah, I, I think yeah. that that's prudent. So why don't we move over to the other? So we'll take uh, we'll take three loops at, at um, P two backup, and then two at, if everything goes well, two at the flipped position angle. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. I'll let them know. Thank you. Akta, you can go. Sorry. Yeah, no, I will go. Uh, so we're going to forego this last loop. So we're not going to do the sixth loop here. Um, and we'd like to move to our uh, second pointing. So P2 underscore backup. OK. So the next is the uh, last loop. Yeah, so as, as soon as this loop is over, then we'd like to move to that one. And actually, since we're already rotated at 180, we may as well go to the to the flipped one. Um, so that way we don't have to rotate back to zero. And then we're going to eventually go to the, the original pointing. So um, maybe we could do P2 underscore backup underscore flip first. Okay, P2. Okay, I make, I make a P2 flip. Okay. So uh, that's a final loop. Yeah. Yeah, we just wanted to uh, move to the next one so that we did five loops here. Oh. Oh, okay. Uh, already. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, I have finished the five loops. Yeah. So we, we can abort this and we'll go to the um, P2 underscore backup underscore flip. Uh, yeah. You need to make it. Yeah. Yeah, I, 
Yeah. Yep, looks great. Yeah, that looks good. And Lou, you have the finer chart ready? Yeah. It should be flipped, uh, um, so it's not the flip one. Right. So we're yeah we'll be observing the flip one first, so we don't have to rotate. Mm -hmm. Brian, is that error showing up? Wait a minute. Uh, oh, it's before. What's that, Luke? Is there an error, like the sound? Because of error? <laughs> yeah, I think we're just trying to get the um, movement into the queue so that it's, um, they're picking it from the OPE file. Um, yeah. And they're having a little bit of issue, but I think that it was just more of a end up do things right in the right way and then and then enter it into the queue oh. right away. So I think we're there. We'll probably start exposing. Yeah, that's a better sound. <laughs> Yeah, so we're doing the short exposure now, and this is to verify the field.
Yeah, it's good. Lou says yes. Great. Great. Yeah, so we'll do two loops here, is the plan, and then we'll flip around 180. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. Ah, okay. I finally see the finally found the field. <laughs> okay, yeah, looks good. You picked it up very quickly. Yeah. It's very clear. <laughs> We have a nice foreground elliptical galaxy just off the field of view. Yeah. Actor, I think you can you can continue. <laughs> uh, we're on 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 like target now. <laughs> yeah, I think I was done. Do you want to answer that question? Oh, I I just forgot the question again. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, it was it was something like uh, you know we talked about our project. So I think the question was uh, like, was it worth your time and efforts and energy? You know, A person energy. Like time and efforts and then en energy, you know, like he spent so much time working on this project, so much of efforts and energy on working on this project. Was it all worth it? Oh, okay. I think this should go to Brian, this question. <laughs> Does that worth it? <laughs> I think it should come um, to me. <laughs> yeah. That's the most familiar, yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe Raja. Is it worth it? No, uh, um, so uh, let me, I think uh, short answer is yes, but what makes it worth it is what I want to say. I think the most important thing in my journey, I, I've been a researcher for 36 years, my most important part of my journey is the people, the people I've come to work with, the people who I've looked up to, the people who've looked up to me, and um, it's been an amazing group of people. I mean, um, and this is again coming back to the fact that science ultimately is a human endeavor, it's a team endeavor. Um, a distant second is the fun of tackling big, fun, complex projects or inspiring projects, projects that are big in terms of time, mass, distance. That's a distant second compared to the fun of working with some of the most amazing people. I would say it's totally worth it. Yes, the Earth did rotate faster in the past to answer the question. But the slowdown rate is two milliseconds per century. That's how much longer the day is getting.
Start exposure. Start exposure.
exposure. Okay, somebody um, else should answer this question. Is it hard to become an astronomer? <clears throat> Preeti, why, why does somebody else need to answer that question? Are you not an astronomer? Not completely yet. I haven't finished my project. I think you're observing on a very <laughs> large telescope right now. <laughs> that, that right. Constitutes um, astronomer. Okay, I guess so. Thanks. <laughs> um, I guess, well, in some sense it is, and in some sense it's not. It all depends on how excited you are about what you're doing and um, how in enjoyable you find what you do day to day. So I love being able to observe like this. I love my group. Um, I love my mentors. Um, they are, they're the most supportive people I've had in this field. So on all those academic fronts, um, I really enjoy it. The hard part for me is coding, struggling uh, with that and um, not being able to come up with smart questions. Now that's my personal journey. So I think the answer varies um, depending on where you are um, philosophically, mentally, I guess, and also the people around you, the community you have. Um, at my old school, when COVID wasn't happening, um, I was able to work with people in the same, um, you know, a room. So we would help each other and things were easier. Now that everybody's isolated, um, it's a little harder. So I think it depends very much on the situation and also the people who are mentoring you and um, your friends that would help you with whatever struggles you're facing at the time. Um, so I can speak to that a little bit. So thank you, Preeti, for answering. And, and yes, you are an astronomer. So you're at a different stage in, in your career than uh, Lou or myself or Raja. Um, but um, yeah, so we're all as, working as a team of astronomers here uh, with different levels of experience, different backgrounds. So um, my position is a staff, staff astronomer, staff scientist at one of the telescopes on Mauna Kea. And so that's a permanent position. So I'm not, I've already got my PhD and I've gone through getting a postdoc and then a second postdoc and then eventually a permanent position um, at one of the world's foremost telescopes. Um, and so uh, that is difficult. It's, it's not, um, there's no reason to say it's not difficult but I think most things that are worthwhile are very difficult. And um, it took a lot of years of study. So. I had to put up with Raja for three years at UC Santa Cruz. So that was probably the most difficult part what, of my journey. But what I had to put up with you, what, what? <laughs> but uh, still I persisted after that. No, <laughs> Raja was great. And Raja uh, set the bar very high for my future advisors and future mentors. Um, and so actually having worked with Raja at the very beginning of my career really helped me understand First of all, how how to approach astronomy in a way that was humble, um, but uh, uh, with tenacity and and with uh, intense curiosity, um, and so I, armed with that, uh, you know, seven years of graduate school, um, followed by essentially ten years of bouncing around to different positions, different postdocs, um, temporary research positions, applying for grants, applying for telescope time. But it is absolutely worth it in the end. I, I never would have done it if I, I, I don't enjoy it. It's taken me to all over the world, uh, living in the south of France and now living in Hawaii and in California and Santa Cruz. Um, and um, it's, it's, it's hard work, but um, it pays off when you see all these wonderful images that, that you're taking uh, of your own volition, of your own ideas. And, um, you know, Preeti says that she's not, that it's difficult to, to ask 
you know, smart questions. I think we all have difficulty with that. But as we as we work together as a team, and as we have supportive people around us and people from different perspectives, and we are allowed to use these these wonderful telescopes, wonderful instruments um, to help inform us our our ignorance to shine light on our ignorance. Um, we we work together and, and and with these instruments to to build up a picture that is incrementally different than the picture that we had previously. But that is that is how. Uh, the knowledge works, the, the state of knowledge in, in science and the state of knowledge for humanity. And, and sometimes there's these giant leap forwards that we, that we talked about previously. So like Edwin Hubble um, taking observations and understanding that, uh, you know, more than 100 years ago from a telescope in California, uh, understanding that, that the, these little blobs of light were actually other galaxies in the universe and that these, these galaxies were receding and that the universe was expanding. Um, so those those are big jumps forward here when we're taking these observations of course we can always make a discovery that's absolutely amazing and mind-blowing um and and that's a wonderful part but also these incremental gains are really interesting too so um it's hard but it's worth it absolutely Uh, so there was a question from Lana about the, what the different screens represent, the ones on the on the screen share here, and the best programming language to learn for a career in astronomy. So you definitely don't want me to answer the, the second one, um, because I use a programming language that's antiquated. Um, so I'll answer the first one, and, and maybe the younger crowd can speak to the, to the second one, although I know what their answer is going to be. Um, so what we're looking at here, um, and Lou can correct me if I'm wrong because I'm not an expert in these observations, but in the top left here, we're looking at um, an image. So this is an image, this is probably a narrow band image. So this is a very narrow, um, so it's a filter in front, of the, in front of the detector, which allows a very narrow amount of light in at a certain wavelength. Um, and so we're seeing some stars there. This is just a really quick exposure. We're stacking or combining tens if not hundreds of these kinds of exposures to go really really deep so these are just bright stars in the field that we're looking at and we're looking for galaxies um, that are much much fainter than these stars in the bottom left i'm guessing that's probably a weather yeah so that's that's kind of monitoring the health of the instruments um the the temperature of the different optical parts of the telescope so there's, yeah, detector detector temperatures. So internal to the instrument, um, some some benches, all these different parts of the telescope. We want to keep a, uh, an eye on uh, how hot or cold they get because this can affect what we see. So if, if things get too hot, um, the detector doesn't work very well, and so we're not able to see the kind of um, images that we'd like to see. So we want to make sure that things stay flat on that graph, uh, so that uh, so that we can keep seeing the the stars and galaxies, and not set the inside of our dome or the inside of our our instrument. Um, on the top right is uh, a, a kind of mosaic of images. So these are thumbnails. So different observations that we've taken. This is each individual detector. Um, different observations. This is a live feed. So I think the the one on the left it was just our acquisition image. So that one's kind of static for now. Um, it's just showing our initial very quick image. This is going to actually read out uh, over time. So this is actually what we're seeing at the telescope now uh, with the pictures that we're taking. Um, and then at the bottom right, um, this is our control interface. So the people on the summit of Mauna Kea, the Subaru folks at the at the summit of Mauna Kea, they're using this to control the detector and the telescope. So all these um, 
everything that's written here in the in the bottom right, these are different commands to move the telescope and to to um, change the settings on the detector so that we get the kind of images that we want to get in the places of the sky that we want to get them. So this could change around the filter that we're looking through. Um, this can move the telescope, rotate the instrument. Um, this can change the exposure time. And so you hear this, um, what sounds like a child's voice in the background. The All these lines here, all this stuff that's written, this is actually what is making this voice sounds. This voice is telling us that we've moved the telescope and that we're starting a new exposure. And you can see an exposure is reading out just now. So this is the previous exposure that we've taken, the previous picture that we've taken. And then we're moving the telescope and taking a picture again. And so for programming, I use a, a language called interactive data language, which is a proprietary uh, language. So meaning it's not free to use, um, but uh, a lot of universities have uh, licenses so that you can uh, program with this language. You can write your own programs and it doesn't, it won't cost you anything. Um, and so I, I use that um, in my current job at Gemini Observatory. But we also use a programming language called Python, which is was popular with the youngins. Um, and uh, this is probably, so this is a free uh, open source software programming language. And um, in, in some people believe that it's, it's more adaptable. And there's a lot more user support um, and um, that you can do things with it that you can't do easily with other programming languages in, in astronomy or you have to at least write your own code to, to do the same things that are already there for Python. So sometimes that's good because you have to do your math, math yourself. So for example, when I was in graduate school, I spent about, oh, I don't know, probably three weeks programming something in IDL to, to understand how much, if you're moving in spherical coordinates across the sky, um, how much uh, you know you need to move in one direction versus another direction to get to the location that you want, and that math is is quite complicated, um, and the programming is quite complicated. And eventually, I got it, and then I realized at the end of it that there was already it. So I did that all that programming in IDL, and then realized there was a Python package exactly for that, which I could have downloaded in thirty seconds and, and used. So, <laughs> but I learned the math and I got it right. So. Yeah. We largely use but math is more fun, right? You guys use Python here mostly? Uh for most things, yes. I even all these other things that are written in Python. Okay. So yeah, Subaru uses mostly Python. Gemini, we use about half IDL, half Python. But I would say the, the future is Python. So if you're getting into a native language, you know, Python is definitely the way to go. Yeah, I noticed C++ was also mentioned. That's that's something I used in the past. Um, it's not very pervasive in astronomy, but there's some really cool packages in C++. I'm not like a super awesome C++ programmer, but um, there's like really good visualization software in C++. So it's it's definitely worth learning um, if you're getting into astronomy, but it's it's not the main package, not programming language that's used. I don't know, Acta, do you, Acta or Preeti, do you do any programming in C++? Just a little bit. I did not like it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's much less intuitive. Yeah. IDL and Python are very intuitive languages. They almost read, like, once you start, 
it takes a while, but once you start to get into them, you can read them like a like a book. C plus plus is not, and like Perl is is definitely not. I did some programming in Perl a long time ago. That was very painful. Yeah, it definitely seemed more daunting to me when I was trying to learn C and C plus plus, but Python seemed a lot easier to get a hang of. Yeah, and IDL and Python have very similar syntax. So if you can read one, you can you can read the other pretty easily. Programming is a little bit tougher, but like all the all the Python programs that Gemini I can read, no problem. I mean, if I could, I would still do integrals by hand, but I like the Python. Yeah, I also don't have any experience. You're at heart still. What? A theorist at heart still. Yep. <laughs> I, I love it too. I love pencil and paper. I, I that's my favorite, but um yeah. <laughs> it takes I'm time. Adapting. Yeah, I'm adapting. Yeah. I think people who work on simulations, uh at least a few years ago, it used to be the case that uh for some simulation stuff like you can do it much faster in c or c plus plus or in, even in fortran than in python so yeah. mm -hmm. simulation people still uh, use slightly uh older languages yeah i think um there's a group at uc davis that does simulations um I'm second okay perfect and this will be the last last loop on the flipped pointing, and then we'll go to the zero PA and finish off tonight with that. Okay. After this, make sure that go to the. This would be. So this would be yeah the the lattice. Can you go up to the targets? Next target. Yeah, so this would be lattice underscore D2, exactly that one. P2 backup. P2 backup, not fit. Sorry, can you repeat? Sorry. Uh, uh, that is to uh, back up uh, PA equals zero, right? Correct. So next target. Yeah, so okay. after this loop, then we'll go over there. Okay, after this loop. Yeah, so Andrew Wetzel's group at UC Davis, uh, I think all of the, um, near all of their programming is in C++. And they're all doing simulations. Um, and yeah, I guess I guess it's it's quite a bit faster, but they there's a there's a pretty big barrier there. I think for graduate students, they have to do a year of kind of waiting through <laughs> through programming before they can actually get to, to some physics questions. Yeah, and I think. Uh... Uh, I don't know much about this, but there are also Python packages that you can download, you know, and then uh, they use C plus or C plus plus or Fortran, but you don't have to, you know, write codes in, in C plus. You can just write code in Python and use the package. So there can be also ways uh, around it, around learning C plus. So, yeah, doesn't Panda, Pandas do that? I I thought data frame that that's what data frames is, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know much about it. Sorry, what's the question? I heard. Um, uh, yeah, I I was wondering if pandas was like one of the packages of Python that use C plus plus in the background. Uh, okay, I don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> I just use the uh, pandas a lot, uh, so it's yeah. a nice. Uh, like package, like if you have a like a lot large uh, data set. Yeah. 
yeah, I, I used something recently that you see plus plus in the background to make um, one of my things go faster, but I don't remember what it was. Hey Lou, have you noticed uh, sometimes there are two windows for time to completion and both of them show slightly different values? Uh, do you know why? Why, that... why is for the blue? Why is for the red event? Yeah, but then it only shows up sometimes and not other. Like, like right now, I think for it's a while, it, I haven't seen two windows. Or is it there yeah. and they clicked on it? I, I don't know. Okay. So Raja, I see there's the question about dark energy. Did you want to um, expound a little bit on the differences between dark matter and dark energy, just to keep you awake? I am having a hard time staying awake, so I think I you would also pass go to bed. Right? I know you've you've done this now two nights in a row, and you have a meeting. And yeah, I think I'll, I will pass on that. Uh, but um, let's see. Just want to make sure there's nothing specific for me. Uh, well, uh, thank you guys for hosting again tonight, and we'll be in we'll be in contact, Ryan. Yeah, thank you, Raja, for coming again and supporting this, and for making us part of it and everything. And yeah, it's really wonderful that we got a chance to do this with Subaru, and um, despite the technical issues. And um, yeah, let's talk uh, sometime in the future about, about expanding this. Yeah, bye to all my all my friends, many friends. Take care, bye. Okay. Good night, Raja. Um, I quickly want to say if I'm skipping your questions, I'm mostly missing it, but sometimes I also don't know the answer. So <laughs> you can ask again um, and I'll pass it along to somebody else. So there was a question about uh, whether we often use histograms. Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty easy one. The answer is yes, absolutely. <laughs> so there's all sorts of different ways to represent data. Um, but for example, uh, Lou is looking at our data right now. She's So it may look like we're doing nothing here, but we're taking pictures with the telescope and then Lou is analyzing them. And she's trying to get an understanding of how deep these images are relative to what we expect the depth to be because we're looking at very very distant galaxies and we're trying to understand are we getting um, pictures that are deep enough to be able to detect these galaxies at least to our expectation and so uh, one way that you can measure the depth of an image is by plotting a histogram of the brightnesses of the objects that you look at in the image um, and when you start to see that histogram so if you go you know if we start off at um, very bright objects, there's not very many bright objects in, in a given image, and that number should increase as we go to uh, fainter and fainter objects. And if we had an infinitely deep image, that would just keep uh, expanding. So a histogram would just keep going higher and higher and higher as we're going to fainter and fainter uh, brightnesses. And so that's uh, that factor as, as the, uh, the factor of the histogram increasing is uh, Euclidean space. So, so that's some factor of, I forget what the actual exponent is. And so, um, but because we don't have infinite depth images, uh, we'll see that histogram start to fall off. So there will be a part of that histogram where 
at a certain brightness, um, we no longer see as many objects as is the expectation from Euclidean math. And when we start to see that happening, that sets the depth of our image. And so this is just one example of the many, many examples where we would use histograms. Um, but that's only one rep way of representing data. So we use scatter plots. Uh, we use uh, three-dimensional shell diagrams, um, face-based diagrams, all sorts of different ways of representing data. Um, and each of them tell us a different thing. Um, so yeah, so there was a question about dark energy um, and what the nature of dark energy was. And um, so that's a that's a great question. The answer is we don't really know what dark energy is at this point. We know its effects on the universe um, based on the motions of galaxies. Um, so dark energy is the energy of the vacuum itself, and it has something called a negative pressure. So it uh, repulses. Uh, it causes an anti-gravity movement for um, for galaxies and everything else in the universe. So it's an actual stretching of, of space time. Um, and that's not to be confused with dark matter, which is unseen matter that's probably of a different nature than the kind of matter that we see, like what's called baryonic matter. So uh, for example, humans or, or stars, that's all baryonic matter. And dark matter has gravitational influence, so it's not repulsive. It, it acts just like normal matter with gravity, um, but we can't see it. We can only see its effects. So both dark matter and dark energy, we can only see its effects and infer that it exists, but we can't measure it as of yet anyways. We can't measure it directly. So Raja in Raja's honor, since he's no longer here, had a good pun last night um, for to remember the difference between the two, which is that uh, while dark matter sucks, dark energy is truly repulsive. So that one's for Raja. <laughs> That's dark. It's dark, yeah, it's very dark. Lou, have you seen any sort of seeing estimate recently? I haven't been paying attention if they if they measure the seeing on the image. No. Um, you can ask them. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was just wondering if you happen to, happen to notice. Yeah. 
Hey, Andrew or Shuei, have you guys taken a seeing math uh, estimate recently? Sorry? Have you taken a seeing estimate recently? By seeing? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, 0.5. <laughs> okay. All right. So we're holding yeah, study all night. Okay. okay. I, I won't ask you anymore then because I can clearly extrapolate that to the end of the night. That was good. Okay. Thank you guys. Hey, Brian. Yeah. Uh, so it, um, I'm estimate the, the depths, um, like rough. Uh, yeah. This is from our first night, Hyperion pointing one. Okay. So, so the, like the numbers you were sending me, they're like 23.4, 23.3. Three, that, I think. Yeah, those, those are from the first pointing of Hyperion. Yes. Okay. And that was with five loops? Yes. Okay. So that's about that's about 60, 65% of our nominal depth based on an expectation of what it was 23.7 that we wanted. Uh 22 23.8. 23.8. Okay. So 0.5 difference. So so about yeah, 63% of our of our depth that we wanted which would mean that we would need to do eight pointings per field to get to our depth. So it's better than what we expected. Because we, we expected nine. Yeah. Nine loops. OK. OK, but within the slop factor, that's probably, so we can probably count on doing nine, right? Yeah, like nine and eight and nine is like um, okay to fill up the full depth, to reach okay. the full depth. So if we just game this out for a second, so we've now, if we get through the five loops on here, um, then we will have five loops on each pointing. Is that right? Or did we get six last night for one of them? We have five last night each. Okay. And five on each pointing in the first night? Yes. Okay. So it'll be five across the board. So there'll be five loops on six pointings. And we would want to do four additional loops on each pointing to get to full depth. Yeah. I think we, we just go nine loops because even if, if even we do eight we probably don't have time to cover another one um yeah i'm just even thinking are we going to have enough time to do assuming everything goes wonderfully i mean we're doing i mean we're getting so the first night we had really good conditions i mean we had you know what 0.35 arc second seeing or something like that so it's only going to get worse from there i mean unless <laughs> unless our luck really really goes through the roof. Um, so that depth is probably the best that we're going to get that you estimated right there. Yeah. So probably. that that means that four pointings is kind of the minimum per or four loops per pointing is kind of the minimum to get to our nominal depth. Yeah. So are we gonna have enough time to do all six po pointings at four loop depth in two half yeah. nights? Probably. Yeah, around that. If everything goes well. So we've normally started at one o'clock in the morning, Hawaii time, right? And we finish up about six. So we have five hours. So we have 10 hours total to work with. Yes. 
um, and you said every loop takes about 27 minutes, something like that. So it's like half an hour. So yeah, let's call it half an hour with the overheads. So that's already 12 hours, assuming that everything goes absolutely smoothly. So I, I think mm -hmm. we do not have enough time to be able to go to full depth on all of the pointings. Yeah, so yeah, I think. We're gonna have to sacrifice something. Um, so I think it makes the most sense to me if we're gonna end up sacrificing something to sacrifice the lattice structure and not because it's less interesting scientifically, but rather because We've already had the press, prescience to, to flip the um, detector. And so because we have no images with the flip detector in Hyperion, if we just go you know, a couple, a couple uh, of loops, order, order. we may not mitigate the uh, detector defect enough. So I would actually, I would, I would tend to go for the Hyperion pointings of full depth and then maybe go what would it be maybe seven loop depth on on the two lattice pointings something like that yeah so we can do tomorrow for hyperion and see what we have left for lattice the other day that sounds Next good the... maybe we can drop those hyperion uh loops to maybe three uh because we had such great conditions at least pointing one and pointing two we had such yeah. great conditions the, the first night. So even if we get this kind of the conditions tonight, which are already really good, um, or maybe even in something a little bit worse, we can absorb only doing eight uh, loops in each one of those pointings. So let's see if we can shave off just a, a tiny bit of time. Yeah, I think eight, um, it should be fine. Um, Because we save an hour if we do that. So if we do, yeah. do three pointing, three loops in pointing one, three loops in pointing two, where we have the, where we probably have the best data, at least we save an hour there. And then so maybe we can make up an hour somewhere else. Um, so we need to do three and three for, uh, uh, three, four po pointing one, three, four pointing two, and four for pointing three because we have like one one loop not full loop uh, like five okay. digits okay. for the point three so i prefer to do four for pointing three and four for pointing four and like if like like the last one we can do three or four it it's it's not like just one loop um because we um so for pointing four we may have issue on like like last minutes, uh, that twilight. So, uh, uh, sorry, one sec, Lou. I see that Pran's yeah. leaving. Pran, thank you very much for joining us and for organizing everything. We really appreciate it. Uh, okay. Thanks to all of you for answering all the questions. Um, oh, yeah, I have to run, I've got class, but uh, thanks a lot. And I hope to see you again soon in another session. Yeah, we, we will definitely do this again. Thank you very much for making it a success. Absolutely. Um, yeah, sorry, Lou. No, no, it's fine. Um, because the the like one or two uh, did the for uh, for the pointing four is already hit the twilight, so the data may not be that good. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, for that so I, point, I think why don't, why don't we just plan for if if things are okay? Why don't you, if you don't mind, could you make like a a plan like let's say for kind of conditions like we have now, and then a plan if conditions are much worse than now, um, and then we can just follow that. So like two two variations of the plan, one a contingency okay. if things go really bad. But it sounds like if things are kind of okay, like we have conditions like we have tonight, and we could go three loops on pointing one, pointing two, four loops on pointing three, pointing four, 
um, mm -hmm. and that that would leave enough time for, let's see, what is that? Three hours plus, so that would leave enough for three pointings, uh, three loops on each pointing in lattice. So that's pretty good. So that, I mean, that would give us, you know, eight yeah. loop depth, um, basically across the board. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That sounds good to me, Lou. Okay, I will make a plan um, for this, and like yeah, we can have, we can think how if if it doesn't go well. Okay. <laughs> Um, no, but that's great. And thank you for getting the, the estimate so quickly. And uh, was the data reduction fairly easy to do or uh, has it been a little bit complicated? Uh, it's a little, there, there are little issue because of the structure there. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but uh, Masa from uh, Suim's team, I think he wrote the pipeline and uh, helped me a lot like over the email for last, like from last night to today. So oh, great. We, we like solved the issue and the output is great. And once it's solved, it's really easy to run it like quick and easy. Um, so it's, it's, it's really good. The pipeline is really very easy to use and it's written in Python, so I can read. There you go. <laughs> Um, yeah, and since you estimated the depth on the chip where the, the structure is, that actually, if you do it on the chip that, that there's no structure, assuming that it's just a sensitive, um, probably we'll get a, a little bit better depth there, just because there's a decent amount of attenuation from that, from that defect. Yeah, I will, I will check that quickly uh, once I down the other chip. Great. I'll let Thanks. you know. Uh, Brian, we're on the last uh, loop, uh, last uh, like dither. Yeah, this and so loop. we're gonna we're gonna flip up to this, yeah. Yeah. And so, Lou, if I'm calculating right, it, it seems like we'll we'll start to run over twelve degree um, if we do three loops here. So it may be that the last loop is not um, not great because of because it'll start getting bright. Yeah. Just, just to keep in mind yeah. that that, it, that loop may not be to full depth. Yeah, it's okay to uh, like finish the full loop um, or we quit at some point. Yeah. Uh, I will keep my always keep an eye on the last uh, like frames. Okay, sounds good. So Shuei, I think we're ready to go to the um, flip, or that I guess we're on the flip, so the non-flip, so the PA zero, same pointing. Yeah, okay, so we'll Correct, yep, the one you have highlighted. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> a mistake. Uh, this one. This is okay to run this to Yep. <laughs> And we'll do a quick exposure to verify the field yeah, after the rotation. Okay. 
Yeah, we'll do a quick uh, exposure to verify the field after the rotation. Is that correct? Uh, uh, I did so. I'm starting the first group. Uh, sorry, Truad, are you just playing the are you just playing the acquisition image in the VNC window, or is this the the flip one eighty? To verify the field, uh, are you just playing oh. the acquisition image? It looks like it's the 180, flip 180. Uh, Brian, the, I think it's right, uh, but it just changed. <laughs> You think it's right, Lou? Yeah. It doesn't look right to me. Not, not this window, uh, the other window. Which window are you looking at? Uh, uh, there it is. Yes, that looks fine. It's fine, OK. Yep. OK. Yeah, the previous. Okay, that sounds great. Yeah, please do. Lou, the previous image was the flip 180 uh, image, as far as I could tell. Yeah, but the uh, the current one, like showing in another VNC window, uh, the, the now oh, okay. is the white white one. Um, uh, okay, you so can see it there. Okay. Uh, I see what you were seeing. I got it. I got it. Okay. You're much more of an expert than me with swims. Is it, it, I feel like a like novice a here. <laughs> so yeah, that's the live feed there. At the, so in your screen at the top, at the top right. Yeah, we were uh, doing. It. Yeah, it's live. And that's a. So I guess what's being shown in the Jenga window is is somewhat of a reduced image or something, because there's a, a frame one, frame two, so it leaves a background subtracted image, something like that. Yes, I think so. Lou, there was a question directly to you by Blina. Um, Blina asked, when you started working this job, what part was the hardest? 
if you have time to answer now, if, you, if you're doing something, no worries, observations take priority. No, no, it's fine. Uh, I just calculate the other, the depth of the other chip. Um, uh, when started, started. Uh, this job, you mean like the PhD or the postdoc? So I'm right now a postdoc. I think this is count as job. Uh, I would say probably um, like your astronomy career, like maybe even like when you first started, like kind of doing research or something like that. I'm not totally sure of the question, but I'd probably like for somebody that's getting into research and astronomy, like what was the hardest part for you? Um, yeah, I think, oh, okay. I think I can, I can think one of them. Uh, <laughs> so sometimes you got, nobody know what you're doing. <laughs> like no one can answer your question. Like why reduce the um, astrology? Uh, so yeah, Lena, um, it's, uh, there's a difference between astrology and astronomy. So we're astronomers, which means we take, ob well, we're observational astronomers. So we take uh, observations of the sky and try to interpret them. Um, in terms of the properties of the stars and galaxies and underlying matter um, and forces in the universe. Astrology is trying to read something into the stars and then predict something about human beings. One is uh, science, astronomy is a science. Astrology is, is not a science. There's no verifiable fact in astrology. So there's a difference between those two things. Sorry, Lou, I just had to interject there. Yeah. Uh yeah, I, I can answer that question is um, like, it's hard to like, like nobody around you like really know uh, how to solve your problem. Um, so you, you may have problems like in your own analysis or reduction of the data or like in the, in the, on the process of like any uh, step of your um, science. Um, so this is the, like the hardest part. Uh, like so, sometimes you just don't have people to talk, uh, to help you there. Uh, but hopefully that was, uh, for me, that was uh, soft. Uh, uh, like there, there are people uh, not like in your own university, but uh, a little bit away from you. I, I went to Netherlands to learn like data reduction, uh, the radio data reduction. And then I come back and more confidence to do that in, by myself. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that, that, that's it. Um, and when I move from PhD to postdoc, I think the hardest thing is you, like some, in most of the case um, for me also, like I also changed the field a little bit. So, for from my PhD, I'm doing radio. Uh, I'm working on radio galaxies and the environmental effect of galaxy evolution. But right now, I'm I'm working more um, like my job is on AGM feedback, um, not like not not very similar to uh, what I was doing before. So the change also. Like I think it's the hardest why take the job and transfer to the postdoc job. Um, well, doing a project was was the was your biggest mistake? Do you fix the mistake? Or do you write ruin it? Or do you, do you? Yeah, there is a. I I think it's a kind of mistake. So I I. In the paper, in the <laughs> yeah. Did you ever make in graduate school, though? I don't remember. Yeah, I wrote one. Uh, so I have uh, erratus. So it's when you publish a paper, and if you find uh, the there's a, a mistake in your analysis uh, or any like or or just the language in the paper, you wrote a uh, erratus. Is it called erratus? Erratum. Yeah. Erratum. Uh, to, crack uh, to crack for the, the, the mistake you made. So yeah, I have two errata. <laughs> One is uh, during the undergrad, uh, uh, for my first paper, there's a small error in the code. And I found that like a little, 
after the paper was published. Um, so I uh, like um, I wrote a uh, erratum afterward. And also I have another one uh, um, like just recent. Um, so the, the arrow is just a, a it's in the in the paper like a language issue like a typo, but uh, we decided to uh, make a errata to correct for that as well. Um, but you you're have... not you're not alone in this. So I mean, this is like astronomy is very hard. I mean, there's tons of moving parts in astronomy. You know, again, you have to you know, propose for observations, you have to have ideas, you have to then prepare for those observations, take those observations, you have to have help taking those observations. So for example, we have people on the summit of Mauna Kea tonight helping us with those observations. Um, they're at 13,700 feet. Um, and so there's not a lot, there's about 60% of the oxygen that we have at sea level up there. And so, it, you know, you get lightheaded, and so it's it's easy to make mistakes. I mean, already it's you know 4:54 in the morning here, um, lack of oxygen, lack of sleep, uh, very easy to make mistakes during that time. Then you have to analyze all those data, and then you have to publish things, and and even just you know writing a word wrong um, can can lead to an erratum. <clears throat> but this is why you have a team that works together. Uh, and so Lou knows about this, that we did a lot of teamwork together to, to make sure that each, as best as we could, to, that we supported each other and, and made sure that, um, you know, we were, were doing things in a way that we thought we all thought was right. But if you're not making mistakes in astronomy, you are not trying. If you're not making mistakes in, in, in doing science, you're definitely not trying. Um, you're playing it safe and playing it safe is, is not really doing science. And so you you want to make mistakes because that shows you're at the edge of your comprehension, the edge of your abilities, and you're always pushing uh, those things forward to challenge yourself. Um, I when I, I I am an avid skier, so I go out when I go out skiing. If I do not fall once per day, I am not trying. I'm not challenging myself, and that I really hold to that. So if I'm on my last run of the day and I haven't fallen that day, I'm really pushing myself hard, and. Uh, and probably lose seen a few of those falls. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, so everybody makes mistakes, and it doesn't ruin things. I mean, they, they can be very bad, but it, it doesn't doesn't ruin things. And you can always come back and, and reevaluate. Um, or worse comes to worse, you publish an erratum. So it, it you don't you don't do something like this, living in fear that you're going to make a mistake. You embrace those mistakes and you learn from them. Yeah, it's, it seems that there's a three pixel offset between the full top max x and y. Is that, yeah, that's what you're seeing? Right. Yeah. yeah. But a, a focusing wouldn't uh, fix that, you don't think? I think if we do some focusing, it may, we may have some improved visibility, but I'm not sure which direction should we move for chasing focus. Yeah.
and see what's going to happen there. Yeah. So, yeah. Shuhei, I think we better change the focus anyway. Uh, okay. And, uh, no, it's just a chance. 4.05, minus 4.05. Uh, uh, <laughs> Is that a pretty minimal change? No, but there is the, the point of yeah, change. Very, very small. Yeah. yeah. Very yeah. So it, it won't do any disastrous things. Yeah, and so we'll just kind of see if it trends in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds good. Just be, yeah, just click on the image, and then if something goes wrong, we can go back to the original position after that. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> Thank you guys for monitoring that. Uh, there was a problem. And Lou, the, the estimate right now is 0.7 arc seconds, but there's a, a decent amount of astigmatism. So there's a, uh, let's see, about a three pixel offset between the full width half max and the X direction and Y direction. Okay. We're is getting it, about nine pixels. Three or look four? Look three, right? Uh, this would be. Uh, 6.0. Yeah. This would be the, the first loop of the flip, so it would be the third yeah. loop. Um, and yeah, so we're getting 8.8 .8 in full with half max X and 6.0 in full with half max Y. And you can see on that in the image that you're sharing in the top left. Um, it just went away, but it'll come back um, that there's definite elongation there. So we're going to move the focus a little bit um, and see if that improves things. Can it do like focusing when like taking exposure or change the focusing? Yeah, I'm guessing they have a focus loop. Um, yeah, of course. So, so in between exposures, changing the focus or even while you're exposing, changing the focus, a small focus move is not going to change. <laughs> Sorry, it's the big <laughs> No, it's worth a try. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but that's that's good. That's a decent change, so that's good. All right, so we just, it got worse, but it, it is changing. So we just picked the wrong direction. So you might want to make a note, Lou, in that frame that we, we just changed the focus. So it went from o, minus 0 0.07 to minus 0 0.05. And now we're going to go the same Magnitude, but the other direction, so to 0.09 okay. minus 0.09. Uh, Lou, in the chat, there was a, a uh, question if you could just enlarge the, the top left screen so that people could see the astigmatism. で、
There's some sort of like hysteresis in this. Yeah, this is the written one, most written one, and it gets worse after 14 by like, seven. Hello. What yeah. does uh, n read underscore b and n read underscore r mean? Uh, where, where should I look? Oh, that's the line they are currently executing, the main get object line that's highlighted. This one? Uh, the one that is highlighted. Yeah, yeah. So you can see uh, n read underscore b and n. Uh, that's the read, um, Brian. Uh, I, I, I don't really know. Uh, my guess is it's the number of exposures in the blue channel and the red channel, so it looks like that there's no, no, the read. Definitely not... no we no, already have an exposure. Uh, okay, so this is you don't, you don't, um, uh, these are non destructive reads, so it's 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 clocking the the CCD and kind of getting a it's a I think it's a Fowler sampling, so mode equals Fowler. So Fowler mm -hmm. sampling on a on an infrared detector, it's just a kind of sampling. So you're just kind of checking the charge as you go along. And so it's just reading as, as it goes along and then kind of extrapolating out. And so it's one clever way of, of getting the charge there without actually doing a destructive read where you actually read out everything. We have the same thing uh, with MOS fire. Yeah. Same. I forget that I think it is called number of reads or something like that. Yeah. I think the the, the only thing I know is the n read will uh, like if it is large, uh, like increase also increase the time for like read out. Exactly. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you kind of have to pause things as you're as you're reading them. So, yeah. Yeah, it looks like it's a great equipment. Yeah, it's a good 
Nine. May I ask what you did differently this time? Is it uh, what's the focus value? It's now minus zero point zero five. So we increased the focus value. And so that was our first move, right? It was because of minus zero point zero seven, and then we went to minus zero point zero five. Yes. yes. But it seems to have solved the problem this time, whereas it didn't solve it last time. Oh, sure. Oh, it's, 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 uh, I'm sorry. It's a bit kind of a instable behavior, and I'm sure what's going on after this. Mm. Yeah, sorry. So, whether we should switch into another change or. I, I think so. Change. Yeah. I would be comfortable right. with that. Yeah. Right, then let's go to minus 0.03 then next for the next exposure. That sounds good. Lou, are you kind of monitoring the astigmatism here? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, they're doing they're doing measurements of the astigmatism, and you can see here. It's um. It looks like it's getting quite a bit better, but. Yeah. But I heard you you uh you you guys decided to go a little bit further. Yep, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah, we're going to cowboy it a little bit. <laughs> so we'll, we'll see um, whether that um, makes things better because it, it looks like there's still about a 20% astigmatism. Yeah. Thank you. But there, seem, there seems to be some hysteresis here. So this is that the value that's chosen here is, is actually the same as our first move, which made it worse. <laughs> so, it, but it's not, like, it's not uncommon to have hysteresis in optics. Yeah, I see they also changed the uh, the subtracted frame. Yeah, probably that, well, yeah, that probably wouldn't matter too much because they're doing a positive image here. Yeah. I think it's getting better. Yeah, hopefully. Uh, but the uh, the seeing is getting worse in general, so I think we're up to. Uh, uh, okay. Not too bad. Not too bad. Yesterday is also at this time. Point seven. Looks like the wind speed is holding pretty steady, so it's a bit interesting. Seeing. Yeah, actually, dim is returning better value now than an hour ago. Yeah. Lou, I think there was a question or a, a request in the chat to make the. Yep, you're ahead of me. <laughs> Thanks, Lou. Good 
right? I think we end this loop. Yeah. So, Jue, are you going to start another loop now? Okay. One loop. Great, thank you. Lou, I'll be right back. Got it. Lou, do you have a minute? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, could you help me understand uh, the timings? So for each dither, we are taking 150 seconds of blue and then 70 times two. So that's 140 seconds of red exposures, right? Yeah. So that's 290 seconds because 150 and then 140. So that's 290 seconds for each dither. And then we are taking nine dithers. Uh, so that's already like if you do two, if you do so 190 times um uh i lost uh, but i can i can explain from the beginning um so just just let, let's just try for the blue band the blue band is uh 150 seconds for each dither right and then we have nine dither pattern uh number of dither so wow. 150 times nine and you're gonna divide that by um, 60 to get minutes. Uh, so this is uh, second. Yeah, this is uh, 22.5 minutes. Right. Right. This is for the blue. Right. And you're asking like, like for the right part. So this right. is a the swim is simultaneously get two bend. Oh, okay, that's what I was missing. That makes okay. sense. Yeah, because I ended up adding twenty two to twenty two. Oh, you're twenty two. Um, the other uh, simultaneously. I see. So then, how are you calculating? Uh, overall exposure time for the source. So do you just use like one of them or do you just take like for however long we were on that source? Because in your email, I think you mentioned number about like total this integration time on a given source. Okay. Yeah, so, so I, I think you're asking how I decided the total exposure time for that. Uh, like okay, it sounds fine. Let us try just one, one more push. And okay, no, no, that's great. I'm happy to push yeah. it. Yeah, please. Yeah. Okay, I see they're changing to the focus change to minus oh, yeah. oh one. Yep, that's right. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna keep pushing. Um, it it looks like it's improving things. So, um. Yeah. Uh, no, the value is almost the same actually, but we still have an obligation toward the diagonal direction. So, uh, yeah, let us try another one. Yep. Of uh, course, this works. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, mm, Acta, um, hmm. so uh, the depth is depend on like, um, depend on like the O2 emission, like the limit of the O2 emission. Um, so here we got the narrow band is a, like, is a, is a small like range in the, in the like broadband. So what you actually do is take a, a subtraction from the broadband and the narrow band. So you get anything left is the basically the O2 emission. Mm -hmm. um, so 
what I do is I have the um, the broadband depth. Um, so I assume one um, narrowband depth. So I subtract them and calculate the auto emission. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Nice job, guys. Thank you. Yeah, we should have noticed Um, so when, when you get the, like, does that make sense to you? Like, yeah, no, I get that. I, I'm wondering like right now. So right now you said that it takes both blue and, it takes both blue and red observations simultaneously, right? So, yeah. uh, so, so in that case, so for given dither, do you consider the exposure time to be 70 times uh, two? So like 140, I guess both of them are equivalent, right? One, one is 140 and one is 150. So do you just use that value? And then you multiply that by like nine dither patterns and then how many looks we are taking? Is it how you are calculating the integration time for the whole sources? Or do you oh, add the integration time of blue and red together? When you mentioned like the final number in the email, how are you calculating that? Um, so for for the exposure time for each frame, um, this is taken from uh, the same as Morix that uh, we used before, and that's uh, O'Brien decided that. Um, so I just took that the same. <laughs> I didn't change that uh, for the narrowband. The the Morix uh, study is also using a narrowband. Um, so but in a little bit, uh, um, a little bit uh, like brighter, like near infrared, uh, but basically it should like, like same. So the same, so this exposure time, the thing you want to make sure is that like in each frame, the stars is not saturated. Um, so as long as it now saturated, you can also always push that to like a larger number. It's okay. Um, and also, if it if it is longer, there's a like background. Uh, it will be, will be higher, I think. Uh, so you kind of have to think about that too, because you take a long exposure, the background uh, will will also be higher. Uh, so for the medium band, the the right band is seventy second. Uh, it's just uh, because it's a broadband. We don't want to take long exposure on that to get saturated on the stars, and the background will also be like the same the same reason. Um, because the filter is is wider to get light more. Oh. So that's why how you decided. That makes sense? Okay. Yeah, thanks so much. So uh, in, in some ways it would be right to say, like if you observe this source for an hour, uh, you know, it will be like one hour integration time in blue and then one hour integration time in red. So in some ways we have like two hour time on the source, right? Because you're using different filters, but overall you have like two hours of observations for the source, right? Yeah, you can think that way. Yeah, yeah that's cool that it can take uh, both of them simultaneously. Yeah, this is the like advantage of swings. Is it is it only two or like 
what's the upper limit like how many filters can you use simultaneously do you know for swims only two two okay So I think I might have missed this, but for tomorrow, are we taking observations of both flipped and unflipped version? Yes, we took flip and non-flip, like original, because there is a structure uh, <laughs> in the narrow band. Um, so if we flip 180, it's uh, on the other side. So hopefully we'll, after combining all the image, um, it will average out. Right, okay. Uh, Shui, can I ask you a favor? Absolutely. Um, so on our next couple of nights, we're going to do a 180 flip of the findings that we've already observed on the previous nights. And I was wondering if you um, just update the OPE file now so that we could have those ready for the next okay. night. Yeah. So I can I can tell you which pointings those are. If you scroll up in the OPE file, I can tell you which ones they are. Start exposure. So this should be uh, Hyperion one through four. Hyperion one. So one, two, three, and four. And so, yeah, we just like to flip each one of those by 180. Okay. Lou, you didn't, you, did you rename these? Like, uh, cause <coughs> I remember yes. the, the changed uh, Hyperion pointings were like, backup or something like that, but these are the correct ones, right? Yeah, this is the correct one. Okay. So I would use the backup. Yeah, okay. I figured you would have correct me if I was saying something silly. Mm -hmm. Look at 
telescope. Exposure. So yeah, this Lou, this also means we're not gonna we're not gonna target AOS, the second peak, right? That's the that's pointing five, if I remember right. Uh, um, sorry, I didn't. Yeah, so are. like uh, pointing five was the one, uh, the second most massive peak of Hyperion uh, was pointing five. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. So, so that means we're going to go The lower one. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, we should have applied to, to swims for 22A. We'll have to do that again for 22B because, um, yeah, the, I think we've, we're leaving a lot of this stuff undone. And I'm really curious to see what to what happens with the data and the lattice structure. And I'm guessing we can actually go after other lattice structures with swims. Yeah. I like um yeah, we can we we have an, one more chance. If we propose for uh same time next year. Yeah, and then swims is going off the telescope after that and Marx is being yeah. put back on. Uh, but Marx will put back on after a year. A year after swims comes off? Yes. What's happening in the interim between, the, between those two, do you know? No idea. And I, I think when Marx back, it doesn't, it, it's not uh, the, the spring Marx. No, so, no, no, no. They need yeah. ground layer adaptive optics for that, which uh, I was just talking with Ichi, and I think that's five years before they they're going to have that ready, and they still need quite a bit of funding, so several million dollars before they're going to be able to really get that off the ground. So it looks like an amazing instrument, absolutely amazing. So I, I think he said the the field of view was like something like sixteen by sixteen arc minutes, and then. It's going to deliver with the ground layer adaptive optics. It's going to deliver like 0.2 arc second image quality across that entire field of view. That's really nice. So I mean, you're almost you're almost at Hubble resolution yeah. there over a field of view, which is, I mean, Hubble. What is like with C3 is like one and a half arc minutes on its side. It's a rectangle, but something like that. So I mean. Even W first is like not even close to that big. Yeah. Well, it takes time. Exposure. Yeah, no, uh, nobody to my knowledge has ground layer adaptive optics going yet. And Gemini is also working uh, towards there. But... BLT has a adapted optic or oh, oh, AO. Yeah, they have they have the next generation AO uh, like for Muse. Um, so they have these like four lasers, but I don't think it's ground layer. Uh, if I, I'm not an adaptive op optics expert, but I don't think it, they they take care of the ground layer. The ground layer is really tough, and that's actually where most of the the seeing bubbles come from. So 
Um, I, I it, to my knowledge that I mean there's prototypes out there, but to my knowledge that hasn't been developed in any yeah. operational capacity yet. Okay. I only know that the 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 one at where are you for me? Uh, oh, oh, I, the, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but I, I'm not sure what's going on with it. You know, yeah, they I I heard that they're working on it, but I'm not sure. Yeah, what's the result they got so far? Hawkeye is on one of the VLT uh, telescopes, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, they have a uh, you know adapt adaptive second mirror. But, yeah, really, yeah, Subaru is also curious about what's going on for the Jolia with VLT. Yeah. But it's part we're not sure about. Yeah, I think Gemini is as, as well. Uh, I see. Okay. Yeah, they, they hired Christoph from Subaru uh, to work on so mm -hmm. Christoph Lejean. Oh, so yeah, that's right. Now at Gemini, yeah. yeah. So he started the same day that I started at Gemini. Um, and oh really? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we got training together and everything. Um, <laughs> and yeah, so I think they're starting to ramp that up. But I think they have some money for it, but not enough people at this point yet. Oh, I guess really? it's, yeah, but I think, <laughs> I think it's really hard. Yeah, yeah, I think it's really hard to find good people for that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I know Stuber does have some plans for ground level AO with ultimate. Um, yes, yes, that's right. Yeah. Don't know much about that, unfortunately, but. Yeah, actually, no, we know as well as working for the you know, that adaptive secondary mirror system. And yeah, the problem is, you know, we also need a laser guide star system as well. We have to launch at least four of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's uh, not right. a very challenging thing to do. Yeah, yeah. It's a good thing. Good news for Subaru is we got just funded for 10 year fund for next 10 year operation. And that includes the development of the you know adaptive secondary mirror as well. I agree. We hope we can do something. Yeah. Is that the next budget? Yeah, that's right. Next budget. Okay. That's the Subaru 2 project. Yes, yeah. Andrew, what time do you have to leave the summit this tonight? Um, let me double check. Get on kicking. Oh, it'll be around summit. <laughs> Uh, so Lou, I guess we're we're getting pretty close to the last uh, exposures on this loop. It looks like we'll hit just about twelve degree if we do one more loop. Hello. Yeah, seven, seven, sixteen. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, can we get from Brad to Narvan? I think so because we have a lot of people here. This is a one, one, two, nine, two. Yeah. We're using a random context. Will this be the genius structure? Yeah, in a game. Okay, okay. So maybe I'll have fun. Hello. Uh, yes. One second. Do you have a minute? Yeah. 
Uh, so uh, the screen that's like on your uh, rightmost, that's kind of hidden on the other screen, uh, that's the one where they show live feed, right? That's the live feed one? Yeah. Uh, this is a, the live. So why yeah. does the, uh, the pattern only, like if you look at last two images over there, ah, uh, which just changed. Okay, I guess last three images. So you can see, uh, ah, it skips changing. Okay, you can see that kind of structure on one of them, but then not in the other. The Why yeah, does it okay. dis even though like both of them are blue frames, you know? Yeah, so that's the uh, 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 like a structure we call structure in the blue uh, blue band. So this is the reason we flip it. But then why is it not there in the other frame? Oh, that's the flipped one? Is that the flipped one? No, no, the other one is red. I think they don't have that. The red band doesn't have the problem. It's only the blue band. No, even the blue band, if you look at the one that's like in the middle, uh, second so from last. There are two chips. The structure is only one on one, one of the chips. Ah, I see. That makes sense. Okay. Lou, we just got a seeing estimate of about 0 0.5, 0 0.55. Wow. So, you know. Okay. I think we can go another one. Fine. Oh, yeah, definitely. We wouldn't want to waste this time. We just hit 18 degree, so... Unless you want to look for Messier objects, I say we continue with our, our serious science. So um, are we observing both chips in blue and red? Um, don't worry, we'll make, a, we'll make a pretty picture of this one, Andrew. Yes, so it's a simultaneously. Uh, we'll do one more loop here. Same, same thing. I think that's the one for oh, swing. Simultaneous. <laughs> yep. Okay. Thanks, Liz. And is the lattice the in your email? I see lattice P one backup and lattice P two backup. Yes. Is that the the two chips you're talking about? No, no, no. Uh, I'm talking about, uh, hold on. Mm, let me see. Hold on. No, we're going to forego standard star tonight. We don't need it. Um, yeah, you can see here. Did you guys um, have a standard for the first so this time? This is a server? full field of view of swings. So mm -hmm. it's three to five. 0.6 arc second, and uh, there are few Yeah, we're gonna we're in the one of them is 3.3 times 3.3. Three three three. So this is a box here, and the other no, is I can't hear you. Thank you for asking. You can't hear me. Okay, sorry, I couldn't hear you over the other um, top. Oh, okay. can you please say it again? Um, so can you see the like the big uh, VNC I'm seeing yeah. right now? Um, so this is the full uh, whole field of view of the swims. Mm -hmm. So it's six point six times uh, uh, three point three times six point six, mm -hmm. and there are two CCD like we call it two chips. Um, oh, um, I see. Okay. On the full field, um, so one of them like this one, and there's this. Chip. This is chip one and on the right, and chip two mm -hmm. on the left. Okay. And, um, so this is only th this. The showing up uh, figure is for blue band, so it's a narrow band image, okay. and we it simultaneously will observe a red band. H. We use H three in red. Okay. Um, and the structure is only showing on the blue mm -hmm. uh, band and on chip one. Okay, I see that makes sense. But we see we see structure in in all of the chips, right? So I mean, like 
even though when we're looking at in the mainframe here, uh, sorry, in the, the rightmost screen, we see structure there as well, but that's more fringing and other, other properties of the optics rather than the defect that we're seeing in the actual detector on the chip okay. you guys were talking about. So there's, there's different things going on here. One's an actual physical problem with the detector. Another one has to do with how the, the, mm, the photons interact with the, with the detector. Okay. Thank you. But yeah, you could be tricked into thinking this guy has some sort of like wavy pattern or, I mean, those, those images look really beautiful. It's like, you know, I don't know, like blown sand or something like that, but it's kind of a pain in the butt to, <laughs> to get out of the images because this guy doesn't actually look like that. Ryan, do you want to see the image from the first night? Yeah, sure. I'd love to. So these are the first two pointings, and this is the blue band, or? Yeah, so this is the blue band, the narrow band. Um... Uh, chip chip two on the left and chip one on the right. Um, so you kind of see the structure here. Can you see a little bit here? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's almost like somebody's taking a bite out of the of the images. Yeah, but it looks really great. It does, yeah. Yeah, and the printing. Uh, yeah, the swims also have a smaller pixel scale than the mods also. What's the plate scale? The uh, point, point 0.1. Point 0.1. And we were getting like, yeah, three, point 0.35 arc second seeing? Yeah. So it's, it, uh, it's good that we're getting <laughs> point 0.1 pixel scale. Otherwise, if the seeing, yeah. If it was like point, let's see, point 0.15, point 0.2 pixels, it would not be sampled. Well enough to reconstruct the PSF. Um, can you guys, can you help me understand what I'm looking at? Am I looking at the reason that doesn't look like have any stars? That in this image, like, what did you look at? And you were like, oh, it looks like somebody's taking a bite out of it. Was it the empty part? Yeah, the empty part. So, like on the right, uh, well, so I see it there. I, I think, <laughs> unless I'm convincing myself. <laughs> Thing. but I mean you see there's like uh, structure in the right image like kind of where Lou's mouth is now just a mm -hmm. second ago it, it just looks like that there's something missing there that there's the background has changed a little bit okay. and yeah, yeah. yeah you kind of see it the dead spot there's this there's things that look like they should be brighter there mm -hmm. and um, yeah kind of buzzed out and just kind of weakly coming through. And so that's that's because of the detector defect. And again, like, I mean, yeah, you can even see the background, like, I wish I could control the mouse, but you see the kind of, there's the two stars exactly where Lou's just pointing there mm -hmm. a second ago. Yeah, exactly there. You see, I mean, it's, it's obvious the background has changed quite a bit there and that's mm -hmm. just because the pixels are dead. And mm -hmm. so had we been able to dither over that, it would have median it out and it would have been fine. But okay. we, our dither pattern was purposely smaller um, than the feature, 
and so um and so and so it, it exists there still so if we don't flip let's say something goes disastrously wrong heaven mm -hmm. forbid something goes disastrously wrong tomorrow night or the next night that's going to be in our image and there's going to be artificial uh it's going to be artificially shallow there and so let's say that you know the structure magically ended up appearing there mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, heaven oh, for me again. Love you. Love you. <laughs> yeah, no, you did good, Lou. It's not, it's not your fault. No, I, I don't have I any, mean, any value I, judgments here, uh, yeah. but let's just say it, it did. Then we would we would miss it um, just by virtue of the, this detector defect, and that would be sad. But you know, that's only what you know, twenty arc seconds, thirty arc seconds, and the structure is supposed to be arc minutes large. So. Um, mm -hmm. This is this is not. I mean, if the structure is there, we should see it, irrespective of this. But we can do better than this. Okay. Thank you. But yeah, if you look at the left image, there, you don't see anything like that. You don't see any like non-uniformity in the background or anything like that. You see towards the periphery yeah. because we've, we've dithered mm -hmm. um, that the, there's much more noise there um but and and so you see like had we had we made our dither pattern bigger like let's say we made it 40 arc seconds instead of 20 arc seconds um that border would have uh pushed in even further so um so we would at the ex we would dither over this artifact but at the expense of you know probably another 10 or 20 percent of our field of view having higher noise I see. So nothing comes for free, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, that this is really cool. Oh, really I just want to say something. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I just want to say something quickly. Uh, if you look at the lab images screen, uh, you can see a line on the middle uh, mm -hmm. here. image. Yeah. No, 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 the live one, the Subaru. Uh, I mean the current one, the current one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There and then the one below that. Um, oh, yeah. So, uh, think that's. Do you think? Do you guys think that's like cosmic ray or a or a satellite or something? I think it's probably Mars. satellite, right? That's satellite. Yeah, because it's too long exposure to be cosmic. Yeah, yeah. I don't think it's cosmic ray, and it, it. Yeah, no. I think that's a satellite streaking through. Cosmic exposure. Luckily, we've taken taken like I don't know fifty pictures of this part of the sky now, so we can we can deal with that in image processing. But yeah, now we're getting close to sunrise. This is when we start to see these things. So Lou, can I ask you a provocative question? Yeah. How soon before we might be able to tell if there's a structure there, do you think? You mean the lattice? Yeah, so I'm pretty sure that uh, unless I'm really, really, really wrong and I've been really, really wrong for four years, I'm pretty sure there's a structure in Hyperion. Um, uh, and if not, then we've, we've wasted a lot of telescope time. But no, we know it's, we know it's there because of the MOS fire data and everything. So yeah, the lattice one. So and I think it's really neat actually that we have like a verified structure that we're taking observations of already, um, and we can kind of compare like number counts of O2 emitters in in th those fields 
um, versus the one here. Okay, it depends how like how hard I work on this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it should be very easier because the the coding are the same as like for Morix. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so I when I like reduce all the data, it took me like later time to get like result out. Uh, I will try my best to get it as soon as possible. Um, like once we finish all the observing, or maybe just today's. <laughs> yeah, uh, I know you're very fast with this stuff, Lou. Uh, and yeah, it, se it, it seemed like, um, I mean, once you have the photometry, which I mean, I you know, that calibrating that's gonna be basically the same as what you did with Morgs, then everything is the same, right? Like, I mean, you're just doing H band minus, um, minus H3 or H band minus this this narrow band, right? Yeah, narrow band, I think it's, is it gay? It's what is it, thir 13? Uh, 13, 60, 60. 13, 60, something like that. Oh yeah, okay, so yeah, probably maybe H and H plus J or, or just J. Yeah. Um, yeah. I wonder like, cause I mean, unfortunately we don't have like number counts from a blank field so what would be really great to have like a number counts from a blank field number counts from like the richest parts of hyperion and then see where the lattice structure lies in that spectrum i wonder if there's archival observations of swims i, I guess not because we're the first to take it <laughs> we're the first to take observations of swims i think um so let me think. Um, so right now I will have the, um, yeah, I can't, uh, there's nothing detected in uh, MOSFET, right? Uh, there was one galaxy detected in MOSFET at the redshift okay. of, uh, it was 2.56. Was the, the, oh, okay, yeah, that's, that's the right. structure. The 2.44 that you mentioned earlier, that's Hyperion in the foreground. Yeah. Yeah. So we actually we actually discovered we didn't discover the lattice structure, but we discovered that Hyperion goes on further than we thought it did. Okay. Um. Yeah, I can try like as soon as possible. Um. But, uh, and get the like get the 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 O two emitter. Yeah, no hurry. Just just curious. And I'm also like kind of curious how we might. I was kind of just like trying to brainstorm it how we might determine whether there's a structure there or not, because we basically don't have a blank field by design. Yes. I guess I mean I guess it doesn't really matter because it's you know number counts are number counts. So it doesn't matter whether we're using swims or morgues or whatever. So I mean we can we can do a comparison between like a field survey with let's say morgues or another instrument um look at the o2 numbers around redshift 2.5 like expectations of of number per co-moving volume and then see if uh, by how much we exceed or not in these fields i mean clearly in hyperion we should be exceeding it by a lot otherwise something is wrong with the data analysis so that's that's a good point of reference and I think there are field surveys of O2 emitters at redshift two and a half. I forget which instruments have them, but I, I know I know we've looked at them before. Yeah, I think I I, I come and yeah, all the I think all the Morix uh, like the published paper is something I, I can see. I what I saw is all about like structures. Portal clusters or clusters. Well, there, there was this like Heisel survey. Uh, I I think David Sobral was running it. I, I think that that's the survey, and that was done with UKIRT, with WIFCAM, and it had like a like a narrow band component to it. And I, they were getting O2, O3, and maybe H alpha emitters to different redshifts. They might even be getting C3 emitters as well. 
and that was all that was all like yeah like narrow band field kind of stuff we'll see i'm looking them up right now yeah so it was it was o two o three and h alpha emitters at redshift two point two three so that's not exactly our redshift but fairly close what what's the name for the survey of oh, Heisels I'll put it in the chat So even on their um, their home page, yeah. they have they have like a number count. Yeah, I think I I have seen this website before. Oh, uh, Sabral wasn't running it. It was uh, Eston Smail. <laughs> but yeah, they've been pretty prolific in their publications. So there's. There's some good information there. So do we use a specific value of uh, relative number density to say whether or not there is a structure? Say it again, Ekta. Oh, I'm just wondering if we use a specific value of like specific threshold for uh, number density to say whether or not there is a structure, like a relative number density compared to, I guess, background or something. How mm -hmm. are we finding whether or not there is a structure? Yeah, so that was kind of the nature of my question. I mean, you know, we know how to do it in like the the Vornai Monte Carlo sense, right? Like, I mean, this is <laughs> we we've done so many tests with Denise about trying to figure out exactly what kind of threshold uh, we would consider something a structure um, and then how we tie that to the overall mass of the structure and everything through simulations. Um, here, you know, I, this is, I'm a little bit out of my element. And so I was trying to brainstorm as to like what we might do. And so, I mean, my initial thought is we take a field survey and we have the we have the median value of like the you know o2 number density and then we have the one sigma uncertainty right so that kind of gives you the field there's of course astrophysical variance and encoded in that uh, uh uncertainty but um supposing you know it's just averaged over a bunch of, of field regions then probably i mean proto clusters proto groups clusters and groups are very rare so um probably the, the dominant source of error there is the is the random and so so we have that and then we have like our number counts in Hyperion. so like for example in Thea like the center of Thea which is the main peak um it should be very rich we've seen that in the MOS fire data it's very very rich like um you know not compared to a cluster but but it, it, there's a lot of galaxies there and so we kind of have the extrema set by the lower one sigma envelope of the field and then what we see in Hyperion right and so then we try to figure out where does this structure lie or this potential structure or let's say this structure <laughs> as traced by the as traced by the the neutral cool uh hydrogen gas uh, where does this lie in terms of its its galaxy richness uh relative to that those two extrema mm -hmm. and so for hyperion that's, that's, my, that's my um just the initial mm -hmm. thought. So uh, for Hyperion, uh, let's say, you know, if you choose some measure, let's say again, relative number density or something, you see, let's say the density is like four times higher or something. So I'm curious, uh, does yeah. the same kind of ratio, do you also see same kind of ratio if you just use O2 uh, detected galaxies? Uh, like, I don't know, what fraction of galaxies will have strong O2 emissions. And that will also depend on your depth and all, but I'm just curious. Uh, 
does that does that question make sense so let's say if i use you know uh, all different observations and not just you know narrow band and this kind of imaging uh, and i see a lot of galaxies uh, and based on that if i define number density then i see four times higher number density but not, right now i have used all different kinds of filters so now if i just use o2 then let's say only you know like some percentage of overall mm -hmm. galaxies is emitting go to so like do you still see that kind of over density or is it like higher or is it lower because that will depend also depend on like you know if uh, yeah. no, I, I, i'm just thinking out loudly like if, if you have like dense environment how does that affect o2 so like uh, if, if that has some kind of effect then you might see a different ratio in the over density if you just use o2 versus if you use all different kind of filters right does that make yeah. sense no, no, it totally makes sense. And yeah, a very astute observation and question. And yeah, these are all, I mean, it's degenerate. You can't, I mean, a priori, I can't, I can't answer that question, right? Because it's the question we're trying to answer in part yeah. <laughs> um, and with these observations. So, I mean, as, as you say, there's going to be a very likely a modulation of the, let's say the frequency and strength at which O2 is emitted by galaxies based on the structure. So an older structure uh, where galaxies are less star forming, if we say that o the O2 line is a proxy for star formation, then we would see less O2 emitters. But O2 can also come from shocks and, and AGN activity, black hole activity. Um, and so uh, there's, there's other reasons why O2 might be emitted, but we also have H beta O3 in the in the medium band filter so we should be able to mitigate that some but mm -hmm. um yeah i mean one of the suppositions by drew newman who discovered this this structure um is that the galaxies in these structures are more red more dusty and mm -hmm. if uh, attenuation goes as lambda to the fourth then we're looking at o2 which is fairly blue um it would be attenuated much more strongly than something like h alpha so we would be looking at the wrong line um, but unfortunately we can't look at H alpha. We'd love to look at H alpha, but we can't. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, this is, this is the part of the adventure, part of the roller coaster of these observations. And I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I think we can get an idea of like variance if we look, you know, from Hyperion structure to Hyperion yeah. structure. Um, we know some of the, we know some of the properties of the Hyperion structures in terms of their virilization state and their masses and things. So we we may be able to kind of back that out, but I think this is going to be a very long question, very complicated um, question, and we may not be able to answer it with these observations, honestly. But I definitely the Hyperion observations will tell a lot, so I'm pretty excited yeah. for that. Yeah, yeah, it's a good control uh, for sure, and and the fact that we have mass fire data as well. I think really helps. And again, we're going to have HST data as well, so which has O2. Um, so I think we will eventually be able to back this out with the power of all these wonderful observations. But I think just with the SWIMS observations alone, um, we're only going to get a taste of, <laughs> of a larger picture. Mm -hmm. And I think we're on our last exposure for yeah, I think so. Which is uh, good because I think the sun's about to come out in about a half hour. So that was our last exposure that just completed. All done. All done. All done. Yeah. Great. Finish. Yeah, we have uh, we have nothing left to do. Is that right, Lou? Yeah, that's right. No reason to uh, take a standard. We, we, a standard. we need calibration. We need a calibration. A standard star? No, calibration. The dome dome flat. Dome flats. As uh, dome flat. Yeah, so we'll take down plots, I guess. Yeah, uh, close, close, close that down. Okay, close. Yeah. Okay, thanks, guys. Thank you.
so the dome flat it, it, because the uh, the narrow band didn't have uh, flat available online. There are a bunch of available flat uh, and a like, dark image over uh, online, like but not the narrow band. So I need to take that. Okay, that sounds good. Make the 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 the, the flat ourselves. Do we also need calibrations for the flip mask? Uh, it doesn't matter. It we just need the uh, the flat for the the CCD. I swear. Yeah. So there's a property of the detector, so it, it doesn't matter that we flip the instrument. It's it's still the detector is the detector. All right. Yeah. So the arrow where it's pointing in the sky. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I think that probably can conclude the shadow of the scientist portion of the night. Um, we're done with our astronomical observations and we're just gonna take some calibrations now with the telescope dome closed. And I think a lot of the scientists are getting tired on this call. So um, we'll probably call it a night here. Um, but thank you everybody who's still stuck with us through this call um, for joining and for asking all these wonderful questions and for um, following along with our observations. And um, this event will continue. Um, Raja, who was on the call earlier, will have some nights in February on the Keck telescope and the Lick telescope, which is uh, uh, on Mauna Kea and Mount Hamilton in California, respectively. So look out for emails from Ohana Kilahoku um, for events coming up in February. There will also be promotions on Twitter and elsewhere. And I think that's it. So thank you all for joining us. And thank you to everybody on my team for helping to answer questions and, and have all these wonderful discussions. And on top of that, great observations. Yay. Oh, I was muted. I did say yay. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thank you, guys. Good night, everybody. All right, so like. Brian, I have group meeting tomorrow morning, right? Like for me. Yeah, I said I sent a message. Uh, so let's meet on the other other Zoom and we can uh, talk about the what we're gonna do. Okay. Okay.